What's up, everybody? It's now 7 p.m., and no matter where you are, you are in, in a, a video, video store. store. Your Tuesday night stream for people who miss hanging out in real life talking about movies. Uh, we had a little technical difficulty here, so please let us know if you're having any difficulty hearing or seeing us. I think we're good. Also, uh, you can see our little sign is missing a few things. I just noticed that. That's hilarious. That is because I moved some files around <laughs> and uh, now it has no idea where those files should be so uh, I guess that in instead of me going through every one of them now um, <laughs> perhaps we should just uh, pray that they they return anyway hi y'all if you're a first time watcher uh, thanks for being here this is a spot where we talk about movies on the internet I'm one of your two clerks slash hosts Adam Protexter and I'm your co-host slash co-clerk Stephanie Thorson and, uh, Stephanie, uh, this is our dog. Yes, a uh, uh, more recent development is a video store dog just hanging out um, with us in the chat. If you hear a little uh, click-click of pitter-patter paws, that's our puppy dog running around. If you hear an even softer click-click pitter-patter paws, that's our tiny puppy, a.k.a. kitty, running around as well. I love that uh, that's our puppy dog running around. Uh, <laughs> Uh, she has recently gotten very interested in us streaming. Um, beforehand, it was very much her sleepy time. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, this happened last week, too. We probably just need to trim her nails um, and get her to stop click-clacking all over the place. Mm -hmm. But here we are. It's party time. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> if you are joining us for the first time, um, this is a spot where we talk about movies. Uh, generally, the show goes in three acts. The first act is, what did you watch? Where we ask you, what did you watch? And we'll give you recommendations uh, on things that we like, that you might like, uh, based on what you watched. Or vice versa. Feel free to give us recommendations. We're also going to tell you what we watched and what we thought of stuff. This is an open dialogue portion of the night. Mm -hmm. After that, we're going to run, run and jump, run, jump, and hide <laughs> over in the new arrivals section. Uh, new arrivals will be, of course, what did we get in this week? Are there any cool new box sets, issues, uh, new releases, whatever, we'll tell you. And then finally, um, we'll do a movie club. And mm -hmm. movie club, we pick with you. Um, we very much encourage you to be active in the chat and join us in talking. Uh, you can watch archival episodes at youtube.com slash babylion. And uh, the only rule really is don't judge other people for their taste or what they have or haven't seen. And uh, don't be a dick. So with that said, Yep, and uh, hello to our regulars, our, our uh, video store regulars, Glowcat, Pathos, and Watch Out Wedge. Good to see y'all, as always. Um, sure you know this, but anyone who is new, this is an interactive show. We love hearing from you, not just what you watched, but like we were saying, this is a place to chat, hang out, share our thoughts. Judge free zone. Judge free judge. It's a not a judgment free oh, zone. It's judge free. It's a there judge are no free. judges here. No judges. Whether you're a circuit court or a Reinhold, no judges allowed. You're a judge? Get out. Get out. Get out. And over here is the chat, so if you see us both looking to our right, we're looking at you. Um, watch out, Wedge. I agree. Such an amazing line. Pathos. I did know that our love could destroy this entire fucking world. Actually, Glowcat, Judge Judy gets a free pass. Mm -hmm. Dread is absolutely not allowed because <laughs> that man makes a mess. Everywhere he goes, yeah. makes a big old mess. And we just swept. I, ju I just swept. <laughs> um, Glowcat, yes, uh, we opened a little late today. Uh, and it looks like our signs are back, so maybe all it needed was a little click. Um, but, yes, uh, as is being discussed, the quote in question is from our movie of the week, which this week was Tetsuo the Iron Man. Mm -hmm. um, I am actually, you might not be able to tell, but I am wearing a Band-Aid right here because I found a little piece of metal sticking out of my face earlier. <laughs> I actually was, upon seeing you, I actually thought, did you do it for the stream? Did I do it for the stream? <laughs> no, I learned that I've been shaving mostly with a pretty old razor, and that when you upgrade to a new razor, you don't want to use the same pressure because you might cut your face open. Mm. Uh, and the face has a lot of capillaries in it, and mm. it's going to be bloody. And then you're going to have to put a Band-Aid on five minutes before you get live on the stream. Mm -hmm. But... It could be fitting if the movie club movie pick of the week happens to be a body horror movie where uh, one of the per person's transformations begins with a cut on the face. Yeah. So who knows? Maybe by this time next week, I'll be an ungodly abomination whose love can destroy the entire fucking world. One can only hope. 
One can only hope and pray. Uh, okay. Pathos is already jumping us into the what did you watch portion. Um, what did you watch? We're open. Uh, we used to say this a lot more. I think that because we have such a wonderful like group of regular movie club homies that are here, sometimes we forget to kind of say the, the spiel of mm -hmm. the show mm -hmm. um, because we take it for granted that everyone knows. But um, we don't have like, a little video intro that's like, uh, what did you watch? The first part of the show, very much we want you to consider us as two very friendly clerks hanging out behind the counter at a video store, putting movies away. You're browsing. Mm -hmm. you're t you come up and you're like, hey, guys, I watched this kick-ass movie this week. That's what we want. So mm -hmm. thank you, Pathos and Glowcat, for bringing in that energy. Um, I see some alignment already with y'all. Cannot wait to talk. Let's go ahead and dive in. Stephanie, what do you want to start with here? Oh, man. Okay. Well, let's start at the top. We all know that we're going to be talking about Tetsuya Mighty Ducks Game Changers. Mighty Ducks Game Changers. Let's start there. Is your, the that question mark at the end of your uh, Game Changers? It's new. Is that the new iteration of Mighty Ducks? Yes, and it's uh, hi dog. I think we're gonna have to maybe boost in a kennel. I think we're gonna have to take your collar off. Let's um, start there. That's the new Disney Plus Mighty Ducks. Is that a movie or a show? You should know this. Inquiring minds want to know. Um, that's the new one, and it's kind of decent. It's new one. It's kind of decent. So new one, I'm assuming, means it's a movie. I'm going to take care of the dog real quick. All right. Do you think she can be in the bedroom alone? Yeah, sure. Yeah? Okay. Do you want to go back to the stock room? Come on, boo-boo. You're going to go in the stock room where your dog bed is. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Interesting. Mighty Ducks Come Game on. Changers. I think I saw a bus stop sign for that, but other than that, I don't know very much. Um, I did watch D2 a lot. I'm sure a lot of people of our generation watched D2 a lot and Mighty Ducks. Um, I think we actually, did we way back in the day, like months ago was one of our, one of our first episodes, did we kind of do a little aside on Mighty Ducks and D2 and, and when we were talking about sports dramas? I don't think we got super into the Ducks movies, but I do think we definitely got into, I mean, we talked about it. We talked about them and Sandlot and Big Green, right. really. And the, hey dog, you better be walking past us to go get... Uh-uh. Okay. <laughs> Time to kennel up. Time to kennel up. <laughs> we got a dog who's ready for a W. Um, all right. I'm going to keep moving. Crimson Tide, Star Trek Picard. It's season one and two of Star Trek Discovery. I have not seen Star Trek Discovery. That is more recent iteration, I believe. Is that the one that Tig Notaro's on? Really? Which Star Trek is Tig Notaro on? How is it? Um, also, I feel like you went past Mighty Ducks Game Changers very quickly. We've got, this is a long show. I wanna uh, <laughs> back to that a second. <laughs> what is the plot of Mighty Ducks Game Changers? Um, because we, I think part of our sports discussion was very much like the underdog narrative mm -hmm. versus the well-oiled machine. Um, I think at the time there was some real world thing that I was comparing it to. I think that's how it came up. Like mm. the dudes in their black suits, like all prepared. Right. I forget what it was. Um, like the ice, the team Iceland. Team Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, quack, quack, how, how, quack, quack. like it's decent. What's the general gist of the story? Um, and I, you know, I haven't seen a, like a family sports comedy in a long time. It's like very much a genre that I have, and, and that's something I feel like it's an interesting thing is neither of us really follow certain genres, so there are always going to be pockets of film that we're inherently not tuned into, namely mm. like family stuff and Hallmark stuff. Yeah, it looks Weird. like Pathos is saying it's show, very, very kid-oriented. Uh, Emilio is in it. Wonderful. And Glowcat's his second favorite Estevez. <laughs> um, I thought for a second you you were meaning that Mighty Ducks was your second favorite Estevez movie, and I was going to ask if Repo Man was number one, but I misread that. Okay, Mighty Ducks have become the powerhouse little league hockey team with the big budget and sponsorship, so the whole story starts when one kid gets kicked off the team, so he makes his own team. <gasps> oh, so have they become the new Iceland? So it's like Cobra Kai, in the mm. sense that the... Like, you're inverting the hero, bad guy, mm -hmm. hero heavy, 
roles. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fun. Yes, I knew Repo. Repo Man's so good. I would love to rewatch that sometime. They have become the new Iceland, yes. There you go. And they all have health insurance. That's the one good thing about that. An excellent taste in art, art house cinema. <laughs> what? Icelandic cinema. It's very good. <laughs> Health Icelandic cinema is very lonely and thoughtful talking, movie. I thought you were talking about the Mighty Ducks having mm. health insurance. Oh, no, I was. I'm saying now that they're the new oh, Iceland, the, oh, they have socialized health insurance and good taste we got in it. our films. We got there. We got there. As well as being good at hockey. <laughs> um, okay, sorry. Crimson Tide. Now, have you seen Crimson Tide? No. See, neither have I. It's very much in the pocket of 90s action movies, though, that both of us not only were raised on, but like, loved sharing with each other. I know. So why have we both missed it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because it's a boat movie. I've never seen Crimson Tide, The Hunt for Red October, either. You think because it's a boat movie? I, and remember how The Abyss was something neither of us had seen? Yeah. I'm telling you that, like, with 90s action movies, as a kid, the if it had to do with underwater boat. or boats, <laughs> mm -hmm. I was not, I was not interested in it. I think that that tracks. Now I am. Yeah. But as a kid, there was something about... Maybe like video game water levels. There's something that translated to movies where I just felt like if it was underwater, it would be slower and also d more dimly lit and blue and black and put me to sleep. Mm. That's all. I've never seen Thunderball for that reason either. We are boat haters. I don't know why. <laughs> I've never seen Under Siege either with Seagal for uh -uh. the same reason. And I saw Speed too, but that's just because I got dragged to it in theater. Not a big fan of the boat thriller unless it's Titanic, but... Crimson Tide, you should probably check out. Crimson think, Tide is also my do favorite. Do you think they're going to, they're going to, oh, sorry. Crimson Tide also your favorite what? Thanks for pausing and letting <laughs> me get this one out. <laughs> uh, euphemism for period. Oh, that's new. I've never heard that one. <laughs> you have. Yeah, I have. 100%. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, do you think that they're going to make a, um, do you think that they'll make a movie about the, the boat getting stuck in the Suez Canal? Whoa. If they do, I hope that it's a real time, uh, I hope that it's a real time, like eight hour minimalist drama about the person who's responsible following them from the moment they jam it through the next eight hours of their life. That's all I can think about. That's all I can think about is that who, like, who did it? I, I wanna... mean, millions of dollars. Uh -huh. Oh, no, no, no. Billions. Billions, <laughs> <laughs> Billions of dollars. Um, I, I want to see a United 93 style movie about the Suez Canal mm -hmm. where it's just, or like a Captain Phillips. Captain Phillips is a boat thriller that I love. I don't there think I've seen you, that. Oh, you haven't seen Captain Phillips? I don't think so. Oh, Captain, you like Paul Greengrass? You like United 93, uh, Bloody Sunday? He does the like, his whole bag is, he's this British British, like, um, cinema verite director mm -hmm. who came to acclaim making Bloody Sunday, which is about the uh, Bloody Sunday right, right, during right. the Troubles, and it's all handheld and shot verite, and then he did United 93, gave 9-11 the same treatment, and then Captain Phillips is about that story. Um, but he's you, incredible. United 93 was, uh, was, um, what's the word for it? Not, like, um... Partially fictionalized? I don't know. Um, Was it not? It's not. I mean, I think all movie... Speculative narrative? Maybe. Yeah, that's... Oh, yeah, yeah I get what you're saying. I think they do fill in some gaps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because we don't... I mean, because there were phone calls and a flight log right. and a black box. Um, but... I haven't seen that movie. Oh, it's... it's. I think I can't recommend United 93 enough. It... I was just talking about this on Facebook because a Facebook friend of mine had said they recently watched it. But, like, if you... I was 16 when 9-11 happened. If you also have a version of 9-11 that to you was so mythological in scope that you couldn't wrap your head around it. Like, I was in the Midwest. 9-11 happened. I could barely understand what it meant. And then it just became a wash of cable news and jingoism and the Iraq War. And on became politics that have been with me the rest of my life. So, if you want someone to frame that day for you in a way that feel, just feels human and accurate and representative without histrionics or dramatic effect, United 93 is one of the most it, it, tasteful, humanistic, 
tellings of a real life tragedy that I've ever seen. It is is a masterpiece of verite filmmaking, and I can't recommend it enough to Americans who are young for 9 11. That's good to hear. It's been on my list for a long time. Um, let's see what else is going on. I was gonna I was gonna mention briefly. I don't know if we've talked about this. Um, this is not. This is not a boat movie, but we were talking about boat movies, and it made me think of island movies, and it made Ooh. me think of Castaway. Hi, am. The dog is now harassing <laughs> the cat because she can't harass us. Castaway, um, um, I think there's a, I want to say there's a, oh, Clint Eastwood directed Sully? That's crazy. I haven't seen that. I thought for some reason it was Zemeckis, and I was going to say, uh, oh yeah, Deep Rising, Vanit. Deep Rising, uh, uh, Deep Blue Sea, um, uh, what's the one where Samuel Jackson, is that Deep Blue Sea? I haven't seen any of them. I haven't seen any water-related wow. action movie from that era. I have to. Maybe we should yeah. do a whole week. Anyway, Castaway, yes, is a Oh, I was just going to say that Castaway was one of those movies that I had only known through osmosis like uh cultural osmosis with volleyball and all that i don't know if we talked about this on the stream yet but i i just saw wedge say castaway fucked me up i watched that movie for the first time i really truly thought that movie was about this guy being stuck on an island i did not know that what came before or after was the bulk of the film <laughs> Can y'all hear that? <laughs> if you can hear the cat yelling, let us know. Say meow meow. They are fighting on the couch. Um, <laughs> playfully. Uh, when I saw Castaway for the first time, I was probably like 28 or 29. Whoa. And I cried so hard. I think I cried for a solid hour after that movie. Wow. I had no idea what it was about. I, I, have, a, I have a gift for avoiding spoilers. <laughs> I'd say so. I mean... It's not that, to be honest, I don't think it's that hard to avoid. No one's walking around being like, remember the tragic ending of Castaway? Like, the reference that came from that movie was Wilson, Wilson more than yeah. anything. Yeah. But man, that movie fucked me up. Come on, dog. Get on. There she goes. <laughs> now it's like, I have to get up less and less. <laughs> She's learning. <laughs> um, looks like you got a same here. Yeah. Thank you. Deepest blue is my hat is like a shark's fan. <laughs> <laughs> is it uh, hand? I always thought it was hat. My hat. I thought it was. I, I watched the uh, uh, making of the video for that video, and then the world premiere on MTV when it came out. The deepest bluest. Mm. LL Cool J. Mm. You don't mm. remember that? Mm -mm. Oh man, good stuff. Yes, we did say speed too. Uh, great job, nerds. Um, guy tried to pull a Conse Drifto. <laughs> Uh, yes, Sully. Deep Rising. Okay, I'm just making sure. Captain Ron. We should watch Captain Ron. Captain Ron! We should also watch, um, Cabin Boy. Which is, uh, Chris Elliott's, like, art how like, his, like, alt comedy right. movie that he made that, like, uh, is often cited as an example of one of the first major, like, surrealist comedies that kind of ushered in the aughts era. I, I think when we, when Grandma's, Grandma's Boy was our... Oh, was our pick, our movie club pick? Uh -huh. I thought, before I knew what I was getting into, I think I thought it was Cabin Boy. Oh, man. We should watch. I wanna, I've never seen Cabin Boy. I feel like this whole, like, what did you watch? I'm just like, haven't seen that, haven't seen that. I know. <laughs> There's I know. a lot of 90s stuff that I just missed. Um, tomatoes extension is still enabled. That's okay. Throw tomatoes at us. We, we deserve it. We love it. <laughs> Throw tomato at me, Poppy. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, let's scroll back up to what folks watched. Um, cause Crimson Tide inspired a big old combo. Yeah. All of Picard, season one of two of Discovery. Yes, which one is Tig on? Did we get an answer on that? I don't think we did. I think it is Discovery that Tig Notaro was on, and she jokes that she plays herself. I love that. Yeah. Um, I also love that Wedge, thank Wedge, that is a nice full circle move to bring us back to Master and Commander. Mmm. Which is Peter Weir. Peter Weir, who we talked about with Holden Wook last time. Holden Wook accidentally did a Peter Weir triple feature of Peter Weir's American movies. Right, 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 and then right, right. I was like, y'all gotta watch Picnic at Hanging Rock. Uh -huh, and then uh -huh. I ordered the Blu-ray order Picnic uh -huh. at Hanging Rock that'll be here tomorrow. Yeah, okay. So I think it is probably time uh, for Master and Commander. Master and Commander. 
I read, I read drama as I said that. I just read Glow Cat, y'all boat haters. <laughs> uh, Jaws is kind of a boat drama. Yeah, I agree. It's weird. Jaws is like, you have to see Jaws. Uh, Jaws is, the difference also is that Jaws is a masterpiece, whereas like Deep Rising, Crimson Tide, these are all like, not to dis or have an opinion on movies I haven't seen, and not to diss them, just to say there are more genre movies that came out of a genre movement of 90s action. Uh, and like high stakes, big action, uh, whereas Jaws started that. So I think, in in our defense, I think that's why we've seen Jaws and not the others. But that is a good point. Um, Tigna Taro's in Discovery. She plays Jet Reno. She has one of the best characters in the show. Says Pathos. Oh, I love that. Amazing. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I love Tigna Taro. Which, by the way, if you haven't seen the uh, documentary Tig, highly recommend. It's very inspirational. It's a short watch. Nice, like, Sunday afternoon movie. I have a question to take us off track real quick. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, well, I want to, I want to keep going through the what did people watch. Mm -hmm. But I also, we did this a few weeks ago, and we kept, keep telling ourselves we got to remember to do it, which is asking people for their favorite of a very specific thing. Oh. Like, that's how we got to Santa, you reminded me with Mighty Ducks. Right. And with the Star Trek, I was going to ask you, we've talked about TNG before, how you grew up watching it. Mm -hmm. I've seen the movies, haven't really watched the shows. And uh, with all this Star Trek talk, I thought we'd ask, I'd ask everybody, um, including us, what is your favorite Star Trek thing? Period. Uh, whether it's a show, an episode of a show, or a movie. Um, or a comic or a book. What's your favorite Star Trek mm -hmm. uh, story, I guess? Um... And I'll go ahead and start and say that for me, it's uh, in my very limited exposure to the Star Trek world. I've seen all the movies. Um, I love the original crew more, I think, uh, based on just seeing the movies. The TNG crew? No, the original. Okay. Uh, I, I like the original. I like Kirk and Spock uh, from the, uh, just having watched the first six movies, I love, I love that crew. That said, my favorite is always going to be First Contact. Because speaking of loving 90s action movies and 90s sci-fi First Contact is the reason I became aware of Star Trek. I was a very Star Wars kid. My brother was a very Star Wars kid. My brother's 15 years older than me, so my dad took him to see Star Wars 1 in theater in 77 and took me to see the special edition in 1997. It's in our family. Uh, so Star Trek is not. But seeing First Contact in theater blew my little mind. The Borg design blew my little mind. Uh, I love it. It's my favorite. It's so fun. I love the time travel plot. It's one of my favorite action movies, period. So for me, First Contact. What about you, Stephanie? Hmm. I mean, I grew up watching the original as well. I do love Spock, but I... Well, I think we actually maybe had a, a Kirk Picard debate on this stream before. A long time ago. Yeah, very early on. Um... And it's funny because I think then I said Picard and then I forget who, but somebody in the chat convinced me to maybe sway the other way. And then I was like, I can't decide. Picard's the, I love Picard and I love his intellectualism and I love how much it shines in, in First Contact. Uh, that, that for me as a nerdy kid was cool to see a very strong, very intelligent, interested in reading and poetry and opera leader. Mm -hmm. I was inspiring to me as a nerdy kid. But I gotta say, Kirk's just fucking cool. <laughs> Kirk's just the man. Yeah, I get that. I think I, I think I love Picard. I love Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> Honestly, I love Quark. Uh, Data. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. A lot of Do stuff. Do Quark to and love. Data cross over? I don't think so. Because Whoopi and Quark are from DS Nine, right? Yes. Yeah. Which and DS Nine was the last iteration that I was like into for a while. I, DS9 I fans off. swear that it's the best one like that it's like because isn't it kind of like more of a like meditative like they're they're in one spot yeah it's it's if I remember it correctly it has been years since I've revisited but it's more about like being on the ship and like the interpersonal relationships instead of the mission yeah character over plot maybe yeah um okay let me see here the perfect storm that's a good one Abby that's a really good one I saw that in theater uh, oh no, I never saw it. I wanted to because it was William Peterson or Wolfgang Peterson who directed Never Any Story. And when it came out, I was like, Never Any Story. And I never saw it because it was about water. 
Mm. That's why there you go. <laughs> I did see K-19, The Widowmaker, as well as U-571 in theaters. Maybe we are boat haters. <laughs> I think we might be. Abby's been watching nine, uh, Reno 911, which is digestible for nursing baby Sadie. First of all, congrats on baby Sadie. Oh. I've seen a picture. She is beautiful. Mm. And I feel like Reno 911 is the perfect way to give her some joy and absurdity as she nurses. Um, okay. Pathos favorite is Deep Space Nine. There you go. Mm-hmm. Biggest scope and more serious. But without losing the Star Trek TV show charm. Wedge loves First Contact as well. Um, and Pathos, just to follow up on DS9, Quark is one of the deepest characters ever made. There you go. People love Quark. Quark is Armin, right? Mm-hmm. I got to direct him. Mm-hmm. Armin Shimmerman, the guy who plays Quark, is in my feature film that I made 10 years ago that I pray the reputation of which doesn't haunt me and ruin my career here. Because uh, people on Letterboxd hate it. Uh, it's called Dropping Evil. Uh, I wish I could tell everybody, uh, hey, uh, to properly appreciate this movie, you're going to need to be a film student who is full of themselves. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad somebody said it. No, uh, yeah, no, we, we very much were like, let's make a horror movie that's by the numbers and about a bunch of teens dying in a cabin in the woods, but let's <laughs> let's filter it through the influence of Sukamoto, big Sukamoto influence in that movie, and um, John Woo and fucking uh, Wong Kar Wai and Godard. And so, as a result, no one understands it except the people who made it. But I think it's brilliant. <laughs> um, okay. Anyway, Armin's really an, an amazing person. He flew to Iowa to be in our independent movie. He rules. Um, okay, Star Trek The Next Generation, Season 2, Episode 9, The Measure of a Man. The first episode that they ever saw and made me fall in love with TNG. Okay. Oh. Well, I'm going to do my old copy-paste move here so that yeah. I remember. Because I'm personally always down for like a wreck on an episode that got someone into something. Because that's the reason I started watching my favorite show ever, Buffy. Because a friend mm-hmm. made me watch Hush. Mm. There you go. Um, gosh, all this talk about Star Trek has me thinking about, speaking of old projects, I know you've heard about this project, but I wrote a, a play with a friend of mine called The Curious Case of the Comic-Con Conundrum, where two characters, Bucky and Penny, uh, they touch a port key at the same time and they get sucked underground and it's like all about them trying to get out of this underground world um, with this like looming presence of the Morlock Draconis. Uh, Very time machine of you. Yeah, well, you know. The Morlocks underground. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Super fun. It just had me thinking about Penny when I was doing a promo video. I did uh, my old Trek track joke. <laughs> oh, right. We're not running relay races yeah, here, people. Yeah. Sorry, I did your joke. Oh, well. It, well, there's the joke. Go ahead, do it. That was do it in character. You got the glasses and everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She, Penny was, uh, gosh, how does, how does Penny talk? Penny talks like this. Uh, I, I hate when people say, there's Penny. Yeah, there she is. <laughs> I hate when people say Star Trek instead of Star Trek. We're on a long and arduous journey here, people. We ain't running relay races. It's a very cute character. <laughs> Where's Penny from? I don't know. I feel like she's from, like, Missouri. Yeah. But she wants, wants to talk, like, <laughs> she kind of developed a little affectation. That tracks. <laughs> Midwest says, great job, nerds. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Ding, ding. Wookie cookies. <laughs> Wookie cookies. <laughs> um, okay, Wedge, continuing in Star Trek. The next generation, the original's close behind. Then uh, Wedge loves the J.J. remake. I love the J.J. remake. The opening scene is one of the best opening scenes of a movie. I mean, I agree. I think J.J. Abrams is one of the most talented people ever at starting a story. Um, Mm. Like, the excitement behind Force Awakens lost the opening uh, of the Star Trek movie. Um, like dropping you into a reality where you're just like on board for the journey. Yes. Yeah. JJ is like in media res first act that thrills you and makes you want to catch up and know everything. He just needs to learn to kind of pass that football to someone who um, knows how to tie up the story. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's always the disappointment with JJ stuff. Just like the Star Trek trilogy kind of fell apart. Although Beyond was, was tight. Um, into Darkness didn't care for it. But the first one, mm, yes. Um, have you seen all three of those? The new? 
I saw it. There's a record shop really close to our spot, and I saw the Blu-ray trilogy box set for like six bucks, and I almost got it. But real estate, you know, is in short supply these days. Um, okay. Pathos loves Cisco as a captain. Full on no take bull. Don't take bullshit, dude. Punched Q. That is funny. Even I know who Q is. Uh, I, I was thinking like Q. I want you know. I, has anyone watched the Q? HBO new Q documentary because I was curious if the choice of Q had anything to do with Q on Star Trek. Oh my god, I would hope not. Oh my god, why didn't they just call it documentary? Wow. Call me Hollywood. <laughs> um, and approach uh, extra year for all your copywriting needs. That's right. <laughs> uh, Wedge really liked Insurrection. Um, and... Great, I like Insurrection. Have you seen all those? The box sets are somewhere around here. We could do a rewatch on these. Mm -hmm. I got them all on Blu-ray for Christmas some years back. Oh, well, they're like great. That. That's when I watched all of them. Um, probably most familiar with TNG. First Contact might be why I started watching the shows. Like, but same. First Contact is the reason I started watching all of it. Uh, like Voyager, but don't feel connected to Star Trek as a whole. Um. Yes, Wedge. I just really want to quickly say uh, yes to what Nerds is saying, yes to what Wedge is saying, because I do like the Abrams remake a lot. James Wan's... Is that James Wan in the third one? Was that James Wan? Holy crap, holy. I totally... No, it was Justin Lin. Justin Lin. I knew that it wasn't uh, James Wan. Uh, I do love James Wan. Justin Lin, uh, let's see... Um, is Fast and the Furious. You right? Yeah. Okay. Justin Lin is the, the good Fast... The gr I should say, they're all good. <laughs> the great Fast and the Furious movies. Uh, holy shit, James... Uh, Justin Lin is also directing the new Space Jam, which is the most excited I've ever been for the, a Space Jam movie. I really, really dislike the first Space Jam movie. Oh, that's an understatement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like you dislike Space Jam an unnecessary amount. <laughs> I think it's because it's the first... You know why it is? Why? Here's another question for the chat. What is uh, the biggest childhood rewatch disappointment for you? Mm. Um, that's why it is. I, I have a... It's not... I don't try to have a grudge against this movie. And I don't want to yuck anyone's yum. Because I know it's very beloved. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it's because it was the first huge letdown. And I was surrounded by things that weren't letdowns. Mm -hmm. So when I was like 15, I went through that like you know, like, eighth, uh, like, seventh life crisis, mm -hmm. where you're, like, you realize when you're 15 and you're starting to, like, look at things like driver's license in college and sex and whatever uh, as, like, oh, shit, I'm becoming an adult. My childhood's really gone. Mm -hmm. And I've always... At 15, you were thinking my childhood's really gone? Yeah. Because I was no longer, like, carefree, like, running around, like, playing p pretend, oh, yeah. you know? You were, like, going to the mall and driving and, like, doing adult things. Yeah. And I guess I was lamenting that, so I had a bit of a... I had a bit of an early... I've always been a nostalgic person. And I had a very... An early bit of nostalgic when I was 15, where I went back and watched a bunch of kids' movies I'd loved. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Never Ending Story, I rewatched and got back into... Adored it more than ever. Labyrinth was like, oh my god, this movie's way smarter than I ever thought it was. Um, Return to Oz, same. I was like, this movie's incredible. Scary. Uh, scary. And then Space Jam I watched and I was like, oh, this is a commercial. Uh, it's a commercial that I liked because I was a child and I was the target demo. But there's nothing about this that has any soul whatsoever. I mean, to be fair, I have not seen Space Jam since it came out. I, I think that's why. I think it really, like, me as a cynical 15-year-old hoping to reconnect with my idealistic youth and Space Jam was supposed to do that for me and instead it was a commercial for... Nike, the Looney Tunes brand, and for a series of products. <sighs> and I didn't like it at all. Wow. Um, Thundercats, Glowcat, Thundercats. I can see that. I can see that. Mm. TV shows can be rough, especially um, the more repetitive ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know what I really do like, though, is the Thundercats ripoff Silverhawks, which is just clearly an outer space Thundercats. Um, I dig it. Okay, uh, and let's tie a bow really quick on the pathos. Like the majority of Star Trek Picard, but it lacked the TNG charm. 
I'm fine with swearing, but there's literally a scene where Picard walks in their friend and screams, what the fucking fuck is going on? And I'm just like, this doesn't feel like, this don't feel like Star Trek anymore. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Uh, this is, I was, when we rewatched Community recently, mm -hmm. there's two fucks in the final episode, and I dislike them every time. Yeah. The feels... Dean and Britta. I don't remember the Dean saying fuck. The Dean goes, no offense, Abed, but isn't your brain kind of fucked up? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's also oh. just not Dean writing, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, I know. Okay. All right, we went way, way off the rails. Let's all the way back here hey, to what did you watch? If you're just joining us, we are discussing what did you watch this week, the first segment of our show. You are in a video store. Um, drop in the chat what you watched this week, and we'll talk about it. That's right. Um, and if you're just tuning in, um, we do this every single Tuesday, 7 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Pacific. And uh, we hang out and talk about movies. We divide the show into three parts. First is, what did you watch? Which oftentimes turns into a very tangential conversation. We like it that way. That's what's happening. Uh, please hop in the chat and be active with us if you'd like to. Absolutely welcome. We're all nice. We will not be rude. In fact, uh, the only real rules that we have are not to be rude to each other. Mm. Um, after that, we're going to do some new arrivals. But I feel like we have some more to talk about here first. So, mm. okay. Okay. Okay, we got through Pathos. Glowcat, Glowcat watched Ghoulies three. Ghoulies go to college. Ghoulies four, which is the one with the like uh, leather, leather bound lady on the front, from Beijing with love, um, which, from Beijing with love, is that's not the, I'm gonna look that up. That's not the Tom or John Travolta, is it? Oh, 1994. Absolutely not. I'm thinking of something totally else. Oh, Stephen Chow movie. I've never seen this. I never heard of that. Stephen Chow is that? a um, like an action comedy filmmaker from, uh, I think Hong Kong. Um, prominent in the 90s. You ever hear Shaolin Soccer? It was a big hit for him in like 2004. Mm, that sounds very familiar. What is it called? Shaolin Soccer and then Kung Fu Hustle is his other oh, really big mm -hmm, one. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen Chow, comedy. Never seen this one. Looks fun. That looks fun. Um, Hobo with a Shotgun, which I think I saw a while ago. Uh, a nose five. That's always say Nightmare on Elm Street around here. A nose, um, <laughs> and bad trip and our movie club pick. Okay, so I want to know what your thoughts on those are. I haven't seen, I've seen Ghoulies three and Ghoulies four years ago. One of our new arrivals. I'll go ahead and spoil it because we got enough. One of the new arrivals this week was actually Ghoulies two. Um, so again, Glow Cat linked up, synced up here. Um, Ghoulies 2, uh, I want Ghoulies 3 and 4. I'm hunting for them on VHS so I can finish that finish that collection. But they're so pricey right now on eBay, mm. so I always wait. Um, so how did they hold up? Ghoulies, uh, I was telling you the joke the other day that with the Ghoulies movies, based on the front, you think that these movies are going to be about little gremlin-type creatures that right. hide and bite your butt, mm -hmm. but they're in fact just mostly about teenagers experimenting with black magic. <laughs> yeah. I think um, that was the that was almost a verbatim conversation. You were like, "Hey, what do you think Ghoulies movies are about?" And I was like, "I don't know about like little creatures that hide in the toilet and bite your butt while you go potty." And you're like, "Pretty much no." <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't even know if they interact with a toilet in any of the movies. It's just a photo shoot. Um. Okay, cool. I want to know your thoughts. Ghoulies and three are literally slapstick characters. Ghoulies three is terrible. I like bad movies, but even and I was in awe how bad it was <laughs> i feel that way about uh about critters 3 too critters 3 is the one with leonardo dicaprio and mm. it's so over the top like silly that it's just bad um okay oh steven chow's first movie all right in from beijing with love a yeah. james bond parody and steven chow's first dang that's going on my list all right. And Ghoulies 4 is a callback to the original. That's fun. Um, it's funny because I always thought, like, you know, kind of the rule of horror franchises is descending quality. Mm. But on that mm. note, let's talk about um, the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Because I actually think 5 is one of the best entries, and it's a later entry. Um, I think 5 is... They all have interesting directors. Like, they all were directed by someone. Um, these weren't... Like, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, I remember this kind of blowing my mind when I was younger, that they all had 
like kind of well known directors behind them because of course they're being trusted with giant budgets um which you don't really think about with horror stuff you assume that like as a horror franchise goes on they're gonna pop pass it off to people who they don't really care about but like um a lot of interesting action directors this one stephen hopkins also did um also directed predator 2 and produced the first season of 24 very interesting career Oh my gosh, the pair of landlords in that movie are the best. Yes. Okay, Glowcats co-hosts birthday stream on Sunday, and they talked about five for a full hour. So you recently got Nightmare on Elm Street 5 on Laserdisc. Um, this is one of my favorite entries in the franchise. Stephanie, how far have you gotten in watching Nightmare on Elm Street movies? Have you seen this one? Mm, yeah, we saw this one. Uh, do, you have the, do you have the... They're hiding back here. Mm. Here. Let me uh, free this up for you. I think that you left off at three. No. I think that you did. No. So here's here's five. Um, the Dream Child. The most popular cinematic maniac since Darth Vader. Four's got my favorite cover art, I think. Actually, no, three does. I just love this uh, rainbow psychedelic vision on four. Five is the one with the baby, the little version of Freddy that like becomes born in the dream. The dream child. That he manipulates. Oh, no, this is, we watched this one. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right, because uh, homegirl from number three shows up briefly in this, but uh -huh. then they pass the torch to another white girl with blonde hair who then becomes the main character of this and five. Uh huh. And you haven't seen five where he tries to impregnate her in the dreams I haven't to get seen a child. Five, no. To pass on. Um, it's his favorite movie. He sees it in a very positive light, but I see its flaws for what they are. I, I watched this last Halloween. The flaws are not immediately like top of mind. Um, the sequence where the girl eats to death is still so jarringly uh, like do you see that yeah it's, it's still so disgusting to me it really grosses me out um and this is also a time when freddy was getting a much to be much crueler um <clears throat> yes there are two copies on the shelf of this movie um had to have the uh look had to ha originally I had the video treasures releases of all these and I upgraded them all and I decided to keep both the uncut and the theatrical. So this is the uncut one. Fun thing about the uncut one is it's only on VHS and Laserdisc. If you own a DVD or a Blu-ray of Nightmare on Elm Street 5, you have the R-rated theatrical cut, not the uncut one. You gotta have that dead media to watch the real fucked up stuff. Um... The dialogue is very unnatural. You can tell they didn't have time to memorize the scripts because they kept changing the lines. Really? That's really interesting. Huh. Never really... I feel like I in, saw these at such a young age. <laughs> in five? In five. Now, why did they have to keep changing the script? Yeah, that's a good question. Do you know more? Uh, you, you, you spent an hour talking about it. I want to know about it. I'm very curious. I'm going to real quick, like, will you feed us in on that? I want to just quickly say some uh like you know i think that maybe a good structure for this is like not only what you watched but like which ones you liked the most because if you really like something then maybe we can tell you you might also like this mm -hmm. um whereas if i'm just reading through i might say you know i was looking uh dang at what they just watched hobo with a shotgun i remember really not liking that movie because i felt like i love Rutger Hauer, but i felt like at the time uh when i saw it it felt very much like a post grindhouse. There was a post grindhouse wave of straight to video movies that were basically doing the Tarantino thing of taking older actors, recasting them in something really gritty, throwing the word fuck in there a million times and making it insanely violent. And I just am never a huge fan of things that want to appear to be like something from an era that's gone. Oh. I think Death Proof does the 70s car movie very well but Tarantino updates it in such a fun way that it's his it's not from its era it's just influenced by it Planet Terror is so beholden to its 80s influences 
uh, that it just kind of falls apart under them, under the weight of them. And I feel like there was so much of that time that I just uh, saw the try hard part of it more than I saw the heart of it. Um, hmm. Anyway, Hobo with a Shotgun was that way for me when it came out in like 2010. Um, and then Nightmare on Elm Street is a lifetime favorite. And then Bad Trip. We gotta get to Bad Trip because mm. we watched that too. But we can save that for a sec. Um, Hobo with a Shotgun was a Canadian film that was made because it won a contest to be a fake trailer in the movie Grindhouse. It got its funding and yeah, it is what it is. Wow. See, I, had, see, I didn't even huh. know that it was directly part of that the fake trailer. So there you go. There you go. It was exactly that. And it is what it is. Like, it's got... Rutger Hauer is going to kill it no matter what. Um, but it is what it is is a wonderful way to put that. Uh, five was a rushed production. Bob wanted a sequel out as quick as possible, so they Frankenstein some scripts together and kept rewriting to make it work. Well, that explains why it feels like an art house film at times. I'm often pretty willing to let big budget movies with weird script problems go because I just think, oh, maybe it's being arty. But apparently not. <laughs> well, what is Artie, really? <laughs> Gestures broadly at everything. <laughs> um, All right, let's put Bad Trip on a shelf. Right, got it written down and here. And save it for our section. Where do you want to go next? I've been talking for a while. Um, I think we've got a couple more lists here. Um... Oh, we got Wedge. We missed a few from Wedge. Ah. Oh, Blade and You've Got Mail. Ooh. I hope that was a double feature. <laughs> How else are you going to open that mail? Without a blade. That was bad. <laughs> um, Let me know what you thought about You've Got Mail and or if it was a first watch or a rewatch. You know what I'd really like to watch with you, Stephanie? What's that? Let's see if I can grab it. I think it's behind you. This. Oh yeah, the shop around the corner. This is the movie that uh, um, that you've got mail is based on. It's a remake of, I should say. Uh, and we got this for Christmas, or rather, I got that for you as a stocking stuffer last year, and we still haven't watched it. Mm -hmm. But you've got mail is one of my favorite movies. Obviously, it's one of your favorite movies. Yeah, I love that movie oh, so much. <laughs> I want to know what you thought, uh, and like I said, is it your first watch? It also feeds into one of my new arrivals, which I'm excited to share. Oh, yeah. I'm glad I didn't <laughs> spoil that. Um, so, what do you love about You've Got Mail? I think I've talked about, well, first of all, we if you go back to our archives, there's a whole episode where I talk about Nora Ephron. Y'all know I love Nora Ephron. Y'all know... You know what I mean? <laughs> Sometimes I get so caught off guard. I'm like, hmm. I'm sorry. I just, it's one of your favorite movies. So I just, I've been talking so long. I just wanted to give you the space to gush on it if you wanted to with Wedge. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. No, I mean, I want to know what Wedge thought. I want to know if they've seen it before. I feel like maybe it's a rewatch for Wedge, but I'm not entirely certain. No action from Wedge right now. Um, a little talk about Blade in here, however. Glowcat remembers really liking Blade. How does it hold up? Uh, Pathos also remembers liking it up. Original Blade has one of my favorite quotes. Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate uphill. Uh, <laughs> that is a classic quote indeed. Um, Blade is another... I have that question too, Wedge. So we each have a question for you. Uh, you and Abby. Uh, <laughs> one, what, what about... You've got mail... I, I don't think it's this first time watching. I'd be very surprised. I would be surprised as well. And if it's a rewatch good on you I've seen You've Got Mail maybe 20 times no not that many probably like 12 Wedge has watched it 20 times <gasps> oh and do not apologize we're wait. sorry for calling you out I have a stress <laughs> about watching streams that I'm gonna get called out by name so no one ever feel bad if you're like I don't away <laughs> from the computer or just yeah. don't want to engage yeah um, um, You've Got Mail so be so well written I, I just love it I love the combination of you know, the written word and dialogue and the interplay and different forms of communication and, like, new technology and 
Y- y'all have heard me talk about this a million times. Yeah, but maybe not. I mean, like, you make one point here that I'd forgotten you mentioned in the past, which is the, like, epistolary aspect of it. The fact that so much of the storytelling is done through the written word. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, I believe, is like this. And this yes. is Love Letters, and I think that we should watch this. I do, too. Uh, this is Love Letters. This movie, uh, like you were saying, it's it's inspires uh, You've Got Mail. The store that Meg Ryan's character owns the bookshop is called the shop around the corner and tom hanks's dad's character uh has a similar love story with the love of his life that he sort of the one that got away if you will that they no, his grandfather i'm i'm sorry i don't (laughs) don't know the family tree behind the you've got male mythology well it's funny because there is a joke about how confusing the family tree is really yeah you have to go get the similarian of Mm -hmm. you've got male and we'll crack it open and find (laughs) um this movie is also an ernst lubitsch movie Uh, ernst lubitsch is one of the like great comic voices of his era of the uh 30s and 40s and um, I really can't wait to watch it because Ernst Lubitsch has directed at least two of my favorite musicals, and I feel like I need to see more from him. Mm. Uh, so let's leave that out. Let's leave sure. it out. Um, yes, Grandfather. Uh, sister and I watch it all the time. Um, and Strangely Poignant Story of Loss. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I love that. It is. Um, I also love that Blade still rocks. I haven't seen Blade in probably... Honestly, like 20 years. Probably haven't seen it since high school. Same. I would love to rewatch some Blade. And I never saw anything past Blade 2 either. You know, I've... Blade 2 is a big first one for Guillermo del Toro. One of his first U.S. movies. I haven't seen Blade 2. Um, I don't think. Maybe you have. Maybe you haven't. It's Guillermo del Toro. Um, okay. Uh, great job, nerds. We see your Blade 2 is superior. That is what I hear. I mean, it's del Toro, right? So... Um, I forget who the first Blade is was directed by. Um, fun movie. Um, okay, from what I remember. Okay, great job, nerds. We've got some good what you watched, but real quick, let's finish. Uh, and we talk about what Wedge watched. Um, and then we have... Uh, what did I miss? Did we miss anyone? I don't think so. Wait. I was worried that I did. Just scrolling through here to check. If we accidentally scroll over you, drop it again. Let us know. <laughs> Let us. Say hey. Okay, so I think we talked about Glowcat's watches. We talked about Pathos's watches, Wedge's watches. All right, great job, nerds. What is up? Let's talk about your watches. Um, oh, right. That's right. That Wesley Snipes was so Wesley Snipes was such a diva that he only communicated with the director via post-its. I remember that. Um, oh, that's that's Blade 3. Blade 3. Cause by what? Then he was, and he signed those post-its Blade, if I'm correct. I'm pretty sure that that's like a thing that he really? communicated. Yeah. Wow. Um, all right. Great job, nerds. Let's, let's talk about the movies you watched. Uh, Raising Arizona. First time. Really wonderful to see some early Coen Brothers stuff. Fantastic cage performance. All right. I gotta say, I love that you are giving us some, like, uh, a little meat on the bone with descriptions of the movies, because I love to give recommendations and ta- and let the, the connections go, but if you list a movie that you watched and you hated it, what's the point? Raising Arizona makes me think of two things that I think you should check out if you haven't seen them. One, if you want an early Cage performance that's truly wackadoo and you still haven't seen it at any point in your life, I'm begging you to watch Vampire's Kiss. Vampire's <laughs> Kiss is... Uh, have you seen Vampire's Kiss? No, but you... I mean, it's, uh... You should watch it, too. Everyone should watch it. It's Cage truly, like, letting his freak flag fly, but it's also a legitimately good movie about, like, uh, someone, like... It's a legitimately good satire of the Wall Street 80s businessman, bro. Mm-hmm. Um, and the moral vacuum that's in that. Uh, Vampire's Kiss is... Uh, often seen as this like goofy comedy that people kind of watch to watch Nicolas Cage be crazy. I'll admit I rented it originally for that reason. Uh, ended up being like, oh, it's a legitimately good movie, guys. Let's maybe not reduce it. <laughs> um, Raising Arizona, awesome. The other one I want to recommend to you, if you love Raising Arizona, if, you still, if you've never seen it, Blood Simple, the Coen Brothers' very first movie. Um, not a comedy, but 
full of that sort of style, that camera grace, that wacky experimental stuff that they're doing in Raising Arizona, but instead of framed as a comedy, framed completely as a, a murder thriller. Blood Simple is so good. Um, the Graduate. Uh, incredible and ludicrous movie, moments of cartoonish youthful fantasy, but still dealing with complex topics of rape, depression. Also, Nichols has been doing it for so long. Mike Nichols is one of my favorite directors ever. When did you first see The Graduate, Stephanie? I feel like this is very much a you movie. Um, late high school, and that's it. Really? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, was a, it was a one-time watch for me, and I remember... There, it was either late high school or early college. I remember really, really, really being really into it. Do you know when you have that feeling of like, you remember the feeling a movie gave you, but not really the movie? Sure. Yeah, that's kind of how, I mean, I just remember being like, um, enjoying watching that movie, but other than you know, the big plot points, I don't really remember the nuance of it. I'm sorry, I'm looking for a tape I wanted to recommend to the meet that I might not have with me. Um, that's how I felt about Tetsuo, is oh, that yeah. I didn't really remember the plot beats, but I remember the vibe and the visuals and the aesthetic. Yeah. Um, the Graduate was something I was weirdly very obsessed with in high school. Um, I watched it dozens of times in high school. Really? Uh-huh. Um, and I got into, like, Mike Nichols from there. Um, one that's a newer Mike Nichols that I think is slept on is Primary Colors. I oh, really enjoyed watching yeah. that 2016 election. Mm -hmm. uh, 2020 election was <laughs> didn't have any room for good mm -hmm. humor. Mm -hmm. um, Primary Colors is really good. But if you uh, like The Graduate and you... I mean, Nichols is a master at... Um, the very humane, uh, almost like esoteric comedy that is about the absurdity and humor of life, but because life is bad. Not, not because life is only bad, but because life has the bad in it um, and the absurdity of that. And Nichols really has that human way of examining that without making it seem like it's being done for shock's sake or to be overly dramatic. I I've said this a million times, but... Anyone can, anyone can do a simple drama about death um, in a two-camera shot, but it takes a special talent to, take, to provide that cathartic energy to someone through a story that is not literal. I think Mike Nichols does the same thing with seeing human interaction and mining it for both the comedy, the joy, and the sorrow. So, if you're a fan of The Graduate, as you should be, uh, it's an amazing movie. I would really recommend you a movie called Carnal Knowledge. Uh, Carnal Knowledge, uh, it's got uh, Jack Nicholson in it. Um, I believe it's after the, it has to be. It's after The Graduate. Um, it's, I believe, a, I wanna say it's a 70s. Um, I could be wrong. I wanna look up the year. It's either mid 60s or late 70s. Anyway, it's a story about kids at college who, uh, kids I say, but they're you know played by adults. Um, having sexual relationships, fucking up, falling in love, being rude to each other, being awful to each other, carnal knowledge. If you like The Graduate, it's a spiritual sequel. Uh, it's also Mike Nichols. Carnal knowledge, one of my favorite movies. And uh, oftentimes when The Graduate's mentioned, I always want to say, have you seen Carnal Knowledge? So uh, I think you'd really like that as well. As well as, I would love to rewatch Closer. Um, if anyone's down for Closer, that's one I always throw out there too. I feel like carnal knowledge and Closer are very related. And then finally, because I love Mike Nichols, if you haven't seen Carnage, no, 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 Carnage is Polanski, my bad. Um, I forget what I'm thinking of with Mike Nichols. He made, an, he made one not too long ago that was like a, a chamber piece. It'll come to me or it won't. Anyway, um, cool. Do you, is there anything in that you're like, so um, I feel like human pain in comedy is so much your bag i mean that's what you do as an artist mm -hmm. <laughs> is the comedic you i feel like you have a very nicholsian sensibility so is there any comedy that you would recommend that's in in line with the vibe of like the melancholy but funny mm. um not to put you on the spot again i just again feel no. like i'm giving a lot of wrecks here and i want to turn the talking stick over let me think 
and I'm just really quickly looking up uh, Mike Nichols. Oh, he also did The Birdcage. That's right. Which we almost watched this week. Mm-hmm. But did not. Yeah, I always forget he did that one. Because it's not... It's not quite as, like, in the pocket uh, artistically as his other stuff. Um, I think he got a little swept in the studio system in the 90s and early 2000s. He also did What Planet Are You From? That uh, Gary Shandling alien sex comedy, which is uh, kind of a, a career low, but whatever. He's a master. Okay. Well, I'm going to stew on that. Uh, I feel like maybe you're a little bit more of a Rolodex than me. No, yeah, for sure. It takes me a minute to, like, take a prompt and sift through my brain files. I'm going to hand you this, Melancholy Comedy, so we don't forget, because I do want to hear your thoughts, because, I don't know. Because I think you're brilliant, comedic command. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. Could recommend some. (laughs) Um, Promising Young Woman. Awesome movie. Beautifully made. Mulligan is immaculate and excited to follow uh, Fennell's career. What's her first name? Um... It's got a really interesting first name, Diamond or something. Mm. Uh, Fennel. Shit. Anyway, yes, uh, this is one that we need to watch. This is on our watch list, Promising Young Woman. Uh, as far as the new releases go, we need to check that out. Um, sounds like you loved it. I have nothing to recommend because I have no idea what it's like, but I can't wait to watch it. Great job, nerds. You watched Manhunter. Great movie. Loved seeing the characters I've seen before played by other actors in early man styles. Fun to watch. It really, truly is. Manhunter with that Miami Vice serial killer. Like, Manhunter truly set the tone and made possible the entire, like, cat and mouse serial killer subgenre that would permeate the 90s. And I believe mm, reach its peak with, uh, well, Sounds of the Lambs, but reach another peak with Seven in 95. Um, yeah, 95. Love Manhunter. I watched Manhunter without you and you were mad. I was mad. Uh, Michael Manhunter. <laughs> great great movie you know it's funny I was uh, on my drive here a few weeks ago uh, Red Dragon came on in the hotel and I watched it and I hadn't seen it since like theater or DVD when I was in high school and I started to finally really and I said this on last week or the week before I finally really understood why pre- people don't like Brett Ratner as a director I always just thought he was meh but then watching it and comparing it to Manhunter it's the most functionally shot boring thing ever and Manhunter is so dynamic um, those colors. Oh, and then you started and finished season one of Hannibal. So it sounds like you, uh, sounds like you went down that path in deedly doodly. Wow. You know, I'm going to write down, I'm going to start doing this. Uh, we bought ourselves post-it notes, uh, or index cards for the stream so that we can not always look at phones and I also take notes. So I'm going to take a few things that, um, as they come up as potential, um, movie club choices. Please feel free to add to this too if anything pops in your head. Oh, yeah. Um, um, what were we saying was on our watch list other than Shop Around the Corner? Oh, yeah. There's something else in here that we just added to our watch list. Uh, promising Young Woman. Mm-hmm. All right. <clears throat> no, there was something else. I don't know. Did we miss something, y'all? Hmm. Emerald. Oh, Wedge Emerald. Diamond, I said. Okay. I was in the same ballpark. Uh, Wedge did... Oh, I did not know that Snipes did a TV interview in Character's Blade. I believe that he likes being Blade. (laughs) Um... And yes, I'm a vampire, I'm a vampire, I'm a vampire from you know, Vampire's Kiss. Amazing. Um, Paul Simon in it? Yes, Paul Simon is in it. And Closer is amazing. Closer is awesome. I'll write that down. Yes, and Wedge, I do agree with you. The fire wheelchair in uh, Red Dragon is one of the most... The thing is, though, that happens in Manhunter too. And I will say that the thing for me is that, like, as someone who just watched this in Red Dragon... I anticipated that scene coming up and I also remembered it and was like, oh, this is going to be good. And then it was very just like camera follows wheelchair. It wasn't really anything exciting and I realized in that moment that I was just shocked in high school seeing someone super glued to a wheelchair and then set on fire. And it wasn't actually the movie or the direction that had made that shocking for me. It was the 
concept itself. Hmm. Um, anyway. Wedge had a cute trip beach with his high school girlfriend where they watched Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal, and then went and saw Red Dragon in one day. That sounds so fun. Wow. Uh, great job, nerds. Did see Carnal Knowledge in college. and sure they'd enjoy it more now. And then, we watched Hannibal not too long ago. Mm-hmm. What did you think of it? Because it's, it's Ridley Scott. It's so big. It's, um, it's, it feels like a much bigger scope. The Italian plot... The like giallo almost of the guy solving the crime of Hannibal. Um, like, did you? I, I guess not to press you for your thoughts, but did you like it? I like that movie. Yeah, I remember liking it a lot more than I was expecting, and it did make me think of like, sort of like a giallo Italian sensibility. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm quiet tonight. That's I haven't okay, eaten honey. today, and so I think I'm a little brain fried. That's totally okay. Uh, I just, I'll be real with y'all, I'll be transparent with everybody. I am very caffeinated, and I can talk and talk, uh, and sometimes I like want to fill dead air, uh, mm-hmm. and so I'm trying to build in check-in moments because I don't want to steamroll you. I like that. So if you have nothing to say, and you're like, <laughs> oh, well, you picked a bad night to do this, Adam, Yeah. I can keep talking with the chat but i just don't want to (laughs) remove space from you i think i'm much more comfortable with taking my time and having moments of silence and sort of like letting things unfold organically um especially when i'm not caffeinated which i am not currently caffeinated despite what my coffee breath might tell you um (laughs) that only i can smell (laughs) yes (laughs) uh but i think you're fine cool well then let's continue um I mean, we have that, that space and that time, but also, like, you know, there's always something to talk about. Um, I think we can do both. But just feel free to, like, interrupt me, is all I'm saying. You can double tap my knee, and no one will even no one will even see it. I'll double tap you if you're talking oh, now too gonna, much. There's going to be, like, uh, cut-together videos of you can see my <laughs> sleeve moving. People being like... Super cuts of Stephanie <laughs> asking Adam to shut up. <laughs> Uh, Wedge had no idea that Hannibal was Ridley Scott. Yes, it is Ridley Scott. Um, I I think it's funny because Ridley Scott has this habit of making uh, one-word movies, where one-word movie titles, where the, or at least movie titles where it's the main character's name. And so I feel like you can always tell it's a Ridley Scott movie because it's Alien, Thelma and Louise, Blade Runner, <laughs> Hannibal, Gladiator, <laughs> like. Ridley Scott is going to tell you who the main character is or what the subject of the movie is in a title that is a proper noun. Uh, so Hannibal, that's how I always remember Hannibal as Ridley. <laughs> well, I think we've done every one of our watch, uh, every one of the chat's watches. Let's go ahead and dive into what we watched this week, Stephanie. Yes. Um, we did two together. So would you like me to rattle through mine real quick? And then, uh, or would you rather start with the two we did together? Let's start with the two we did together, and then you can rattle off yours while maybe I'll go grab a little caffeine and some water. And I'm going to do that now while you get started on Sex and the City with a little context. All right, cool. So we finished uh, Sex and the City, the series, and watched the first movie this week. Um, Yeah, I think it was was my, when we talked about this last week, it was my fourth time finishing the series from start to finish. It was Adam's first. Very curious to see like a summation of his overall thoughts um i think my again we were touching on this last week but my biggest takeaway is like the episodes that i thought were my favorites didn't hit in the same way and some of the episodes that i had maybe looked over um really affected me a lot more crying this time around and i gotta say that season four is just great (laughs) season four is great um I used to love five and six. I think because five and six is when it kind of gets into like, um, it feels like poppier or more splashy, like more colorful, a little more playful um, through especially season five. Uh, but man, season four like got me this time around. Oof. Mm. Can I tell you that as a first time watcher, I thought season three, like, 
seasons one and two, fun, very fun. I'm here for it. Season three is where I started being more invested in the soap opera and the, the melodrama melodramatic elements. <laughs> of, melodrama. Melodrama uh, of the relationships. Season three is where I started being invested in relationships more. And season four was where I really, uh, and not to say I didn't respect the show, but before, but it's like one and two were candy. Three, I was like, okay, I'm here for the drama. And then four was like, oh, I respect you holistically as like a show with a soul. Mm -hmm. um, it, it shows, I think four, just as the characters arcs do, um, four shows you more vulnerability the more time you spend with it. And it deepens the relationship you have with the show, which also kind of mirrors what the women are doing in their lives, especially Samantha. And um, four is where I really fell in love with every character and really cared about them. And yeah. I, I thought it was my favorite season for sure. Yeah, I think four is also where they really, like, the characters really start their growth. Aside from maybe Carrie. Carrie's got to be growing from the jump because yeah. she's got to, we can only have status quo for, like, one season, and then she's got to start growing. Yeah. Um, but everyone else kind of stays status quo because we're measuring, as is often, I feel like a pitfall slash technique of ensemble storytelling like this is your main character gets to grow, but everyone around them needs to be status quo stagnant because they have to reflect what your main character's growth looks like or what they're not. So if Carrie says this, if Carrie grows in this way, Samantha has to stay static because we need Samantha as a mirror for Carrie. Yeah. Right. Um, whereas in four, I feel like they let everyone shine and that's why the show deepens and gets richer because they let everyone start growing. Definitely. It becomes more of a a truly ensemble um, show, but it's interesting you say that because there is a reference to that, kind of a meta reference uh, that Samantha has with Carrie in the movie where she says like, you, or they, they actually reference that a lot. Carrie references that, Samantha does, where it's like, if I stay here and I'm, no, it's Carrie. She's saying, if I stay here and I'm right, I stay here, I'm writing my column, no matter how wild your life gets, no matter how, you know, you have kids, you have a family, you've moved away, like, your life is still the same, or something is still the same, like, you don't have to really let go of your youth or, you know, the person you used to be. Um, Which, in an interesting way, just to tie this over to the other show we just finished watching, Community, in an interesting way, both shows do that, where they acknowledge that they are coming to an end, that for you, the viewer, this is probably discomforting because you have probably come to this group of people um, as your friends, as a source of stability, and the show is kind of guiding you through the grief of losing that stability mm -hmm. through its dialogue. Uh, Community does that very obviously. Sex and the City, I feel like, does it a little slicker, and that is for sure. Like, Carrie, as the columnist, like, her staying grounded is very much about providing the comfort mm -hmm. for others. Um, Including the audience. Yeah, uh, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, it, it, yeah. us is the, like, Carrie is so often the audience surrogate yeah. that it's interesting to see her flip it and, and see people like uh, Miranda and Charlotte become the audience surrogate because we might start identifying more with their increasingly normal looking lives and saying, well, I'm, I have a kid at home, like, like Charlotte, or I'm, or Miranda, or I'm focusing on my career and this is the show I watch to wind down with so please don't change and Carrie's saying I got to because I'm not just I don't just exist for you mm -hmm. uh, and I you wouldn't be inspired by me if I didn't change yeah uh, to the audience it's actually I think kind of brilliant writing yeah yeah I think that the show is very well written aside from and the, and you know honestly I said it last week I'll say it again I've only seen Sex and the City 2 one time I remember being like that was bad <laughs> That was so bad. Um, but the show in general and the movie, the first movie, I feel like the writing is, you know, there's a lot of pockets of really beautiful writing, really solid writing across the board. And yes, some problematic things. I think in the movie, for, like the movie mostly holds up, but then there are these moments where you go, whoa, <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what, what did Charlotte just say? My least favorite thing about this entire property is when the characters demand that you remember you're watching rich white women. 
Um, yeah. I love seeing them as people, and I hate when they're like, hey, you, I just want to remind you that I'm kind of a racist character. Mm-hmm. Just who I am. And I'm like, ah, I didn't want to remember that about you, Charlotte. Yeah. Um, you should be better. What is that? I think that's my phone ringing. Is your phone ringing? Oh, my God. How embarrassing. You better go answer that. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, so we watched Sex and the City Part 1, uh, the movie. It's Se- Spam Risk. It's Spam Risk. Call them. Do we get spam recently? Because it might be at risk. Um, so, yeah. My first time watching through Sex and the City, the movie. So, in the plot of the movie, um, yes, they... It's very much like uh, Carrie and Big are going to get married. Uh, they do kind of a shoehorned in, catching everybody up in the opening credits. Yeah. Um, the movie wants to be a movie that anyone can jump in and watch. It's not. Um, I can't imagine getting much from this without the context of having watched the show. But having watched the show, all your favorite characters are here. Um, in terms of tying a nice bow on a show with a movie, six seasons in a movie, speaking of community, Sex and the City got to do it, and I think it did it really well. I love Firefly and Serenity, but if we're talking about shows that ended and then got a movie, most of the time the movie pales a little bit in comparison to what you loved about the show, um, or at least feels different enough that it feels strange. Um, Serenity, I love as a standalone movie. After watching the show, it doesn't feel like enough because it's not following up on the things that were your burning questions from the show, like the guys with blue gloves. Mm -hmm. Um, It's its own story. So it's different. It's good, but it's different. Uh, Veronica Mars, same thing. It's not going to follow, the movie does not follow up on the threads you miss from the show. It is its own story. It's satisfying. Sex and the City, the movie, honestly, might be the most satisfying movie to follow a series that I've ever seen. Because it kept the tone and tied a bow on the threads I was invested in emotionally while integrating in new plot details. Um, I think as as far as if you're a fan of of the show, uh, Sex and the City movie is a wonderful way to cap it. Now, I've heard the second one sucks and is racist, so maybe we'll put that off. Well, I mean, yeah, here's the thing. I... Sex and the City, the, the movie, the first movie, is not great either. It's really not. Like, it's, 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 it does tie a bow really nicely, especially with the Carrie Big arc. But, you know, when did that movie come out? 2008? I want to say 20, 2005. 2005? Um, it's funny, looking at that movie, and even the, even, well, no, no. Really, if you look at the movie, the early aughts, like... <laughs> If you can see, if you see Carrie Bradshaw and she is dressed in a boring way, like that says a lot about the style and kind of what was going on in the early aughts. Like even the way she redoes her apartment, I'm like, what is this? (laughs) Oh, really? In the movie? Yeah. The the first? The first movie. Yeah. The way she redoes her apartment, like this, you know, it's sort of like a live, laugh, love Mm. thing and... You know, gosh, her, her clothes and her style and everything was so boring in the early aughts. I'm just saying Carrie Bradshaw is a fashion icon. And even then, it was just like, not that exciting. Oh, wow. See, I thought the fashion in the movie was great. This it is the first had, I've heard you say this, but I never, I wasn't thinking of comparing the two. So it has it's an interesting moments, perspective. But if you're looking at it and... If you're looking at it in comparison to the show, the show is so iconic as far as like what all the women wear, but especially Carrie, with taking risks and being bold. And the boldest thing in this movie is that she has a bird on her head. I put a bird on my head. Like, okay, we get it. (laughs) I got it. Yeah, I did think, okay, the wedding dress, however, I didn't like the bird. I think that the, honestly, I'm going to say something awful here. I think Carrie needed to go a little easier on her makeup and not put the bird in her head for a wedding dress because the dress was gorgeous and I think her makeup distracted from it. Yeah. Well, the dress yeah. actually made me tear up when I saw it. it I'm did. not emotional at weddings. I am not uh, emotional at the idea of marriage. I simply thought this dress was such a beautiful work of art and construction that it made me tear up in the same way that sometimes I tear up while watching hand-drawn animation mm-hmm. or seeing beautiful architecture. Uh, beautiful, beautiful dress. Like really, I think one of, I think my biggest takeaway from Sex in the City, besides the perspectives that it offered me that I missed out on growing up as a, a straight man, I think that my biggest takeaway is 
that I respect fashion on a much deeper level now. For sure. And the montage with the wedding dresses is utterly gorgeous. The top wedding dress designer is so beautiful. I think I'm talking in more broad terms about the fashion in the movie versus the show. Um, but I will say one more thing about the movie. My favorite thing is... Uh, a, a, speaking of melancholy comedy, a sequence um, where Carrie uh, is going through a very depressed episode. And I just think some of SJP's most beautiful facial acting. Um, there's a sequence where she, she goes into the bathroom and then she lays in bed for days and days. Um, and I just think it's really sweet. I think it gets, it, it hits to the core of the heart of the show in a really nice way. Um, and the relief from that moment, the break from that moment is very funny and you feel it. It's very palpable. I don't re remember what the break is from that moment. Um, basically, <laughs> Carrie asks, will I ever laugh again? Oh, that's right. And, and then someone shits their pants and she laughs. And it's <laughs> yes, they said something it's, you'd never see in that context. If something is really, really, really funny, you'll laugh. I love that. And I love that there was a poop joke that felt not at all like, normally, like, normally that kind of humor, like, I mean, I am not above it at all, but. It just doesn't feel like it belonged in that movie, and it hit so hard, and it was just like, sometimes you go low, and that's the smart move. I think it was the smart move, because in that moment, like, what is the most extreme thing? It's Charlotte shitting herself. Mm -hmm. Like, she's the most, like, put together, you know, Park Avenue princess, and, you know, she's like... <laughs> is that sure? By the way, uh, y'all, tell us who we are. Please tell us which of the core four you see us as. And I'm going to check up on the chat here. Um, okay, so, great job, nerds. One summer got very drunk on vodka and ex's friends and ended up watching days. Uh, ended up days and watching three or four episodes of Sex and the City Nights. <laughs> Big was in two of the episodes. And I remember Samantha had a thing with a firefighter. Uh, Samantha has a thing with a lot of different men. But only a few of them, only one of them, in fact, do I truly love. And that's part of her wonderful arc. Um, all right, let's move on to the other thing we watched that I suspect a few other people watched. I know Glowcat did. Uh, speaking of shitting your pants comedy, mm -hmm. uh, Bad Trip. Eric Andre's new movie, uh, Tiffany Haddish in it as well, Bad Trip. Uh, this was the new release we watched this week. Um, Bad Grandpa uh, is the same director. Um, I didn't know that. Did you know that? I didn't know that. So Bad Grandpa with Johnny Knoxville uh, and Spike Jones is the same director. Um, coming out of kind of the Jackass tradition as well as the Borat 2. Uh, Borat and Borat 2 and Sasha Baron Conan. Um, just real world prank movie tradition. Uh, Stephanie, <laughs> what are your thoughts on... Yeah, Glowcat saying I think he learned a lot from Bad Grandpa. Um, I agree. You could definitely see the growth of the staging um, in terms of like how to pull off those pranks well. Bad Grandpa's solid, but it's it's okay. Um, Y'all watched a few bad movies. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and the music video for Michael Jackson's Bad, directed by <laughs> Martin Scorsese. Um, yes, uh, Bad Grandpa, however, I did not watch. Uh, I haven't seen that in years. But, um, but Bad Trip. Um, did anyone else watch this? Uh, Glowcat, no, you did. Uh, Glowcat, I think I saw you. <laughs> Bad the bone, honey. <laughs> um, I think I saw you posting about this. Um, who wants to start on the thoughts? And if anyone else out there watched Bad Trip, please chime in with yeah. your thoughts. Let us let us know your thoughts. I um, I can start. Uh, okay, so Bad Trip. Let's see. I thought that the well, first of all, you can kind you can tell. Maybe I'm wrong, but I felt like you could tell when the pranks were more staged and when they were more organic. But I do think that they were integrated into the plot really artfully. <laughs> it was really well done. Okay, what are you going to say about the pranks? Oh, I wanted to disagree with you because there were two specific things that you said during the movie. That guy's a plant. That guy's a plant. And both of them in the end credits had an outtake of them getting revealed. And it was proof that they weren't plants. 
So I want to say that you saying, I, I don't think there are staged pranks. I think there are staged interactions between actors. There's acting. Like Lil Rel and Eric Andre are clearly like uh, acting during scenes to set it up just like Sasha Baron Conan does. But I think everything with a stranger in public, that strange, I don't think any of that's staged. I mean, I felt like some of it was maybe like a call to people to like come do this, come to this place. Uh, be an extra and maybe they like didn't know what they were getting into and that's where the organic reaction comes from I don't totally know um, Watch Not Much hasn't seen it I feel like there's not really like any any uh, threat of spoilers with this movie I will say like uh, okay so um, just not giving away gags I guess yeah so if you're talking about like Sasha Baron Cohen like this I think pales in comparison to that I agree. Uh, 100%. I can't remember the moment that it lost me, but, like, the first 20, 25 minutes, I was, like, really vibing with this movie. I was really feeling it, and then there was a joke that I was like, mm, okay. <laughs> like, I, ju I just, like, completely fell off. It just felt so... But then you were saying... This is not going to make a lot of sense, but you were, t you were saying that maybe it's meta. Maybe this very low-hanging fruit, like crass, obvious, overdone, gross-out humor joke was supposed to be, like, you know, looking into the mirror, looking into the infinity mirror, almost. Um, I think my point there is it's more of a bigger catch-all defense of humor like this that sometimes we don't always see eye-to-eye -eye on. Um, one of my favorite movies of all time being Freddy Got Fingered. Y'all have probably heard me talk about why I think that's a legitimately important comedy. I think that this movie had those elements. Because uh, even with Freddy Got Fingered, you were like, I don't fucking care, he's jerking off a horse. And I was like, it's not about that, it's about the shock. It's about what you're feeling. It's about your feeling of offense. And so I do think I have a catch-all defense, and that is simply that um, the old adage of art should um, comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. And I think that Eric Andre very much wants to, in all of his art, like across the years, Eric Andre show... I've always seen him as carrying on in that awesome tradition of like Boonwell and Tom Green um, and other great like shock artists in the sense that he is using that overly physical, disgusting comedy. Like mm -hmm. one of my favorite bits on his show being when he throws up in front of that Disney Channel actress, that pop star. I think he's doing that in this movie too. And I do think that's defensible as a broader like um, shocking people out of complacency. Right. That said... I also think that sometimes he coasts on it. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think you can totally just like say it's great the whole time. We were kind of reversed. I was warming up to this movie and we took a pee break or something and you were like, this movie fucking rolls. Like you were into it. <laughs> I was. And I, I was like, I'm warming up to it. I'm enjoying it. A few, And then there were parts that just killed me laughing. Yeah. Parts early on, the first third especially. I think that for me it was the ape rape sequence that I got to say like, there was something about it where maybe I'm just too old. Maybe I'm too old. I love the idea of disturbing the comforted. I think that there are certain things like Tiffany Haddish starting fights in public, flirting with a cop. I love that shit. But something about a group of women who you don't know their history and you don't know what might trigger them and you don't know what they've been through, being forced to see without any warning... Uh, a man violently raped by an ape like I get that the like fucking with a like person in an ape costume and then it becoming like this sexual thing like I get the humor behind that but it very much felt like a bunch of dudes deciding on what was funny without deciding on if that would like be traumatic for anyone to see on a deeper level because you don't know what trauma they've experienced so I think again maybe I'm just old maybe I need to be younger and punkier with this but that was the moment that lost me more than anything, was I thought most of it was brilliant satire and commentary, but I think that where it differs from something like Borat is that Borat is about shaking up the powerful, mm. and this was about shocking the every person. Yeah. And I think there was just something protective of me towards the every person. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I get that. I feel like... Overall, I really enjoyed watching this movie. I, I did. And, yeah, the first third, like, really had me. 
and then I think like the last the last little bit like got me back it was mm-hmm. like somewhere in the middle I just felt like I got lost in something that felt like overdone overworked too low brow and I don't mean that in like a oh I only like high brow comedy I mean like truly the basest the most base of humor like you know um and and like you were saying yeah that that whole sequence just just uh kind of took me out of it I think that's that's it like and Glowcat to be honest loved it I think it was better than Borat 2 and this is what an Eric movie should be Eric Andre movie should be I think this is what an Eric Andre movie should be I also loved it. I just, it's funny because like I think of Eric Andre as like a very thought, like I also am not one to engage in like moral panic over art and I think that all art should do whatever the hell it wants to. I just, not to put too fine of a point on it, Mm -hmm. it felt like there was a seven minute section of this movie dedicated to a big rape joke and I don't like rape jokes and it really took me out of it. Yeah, I think that's how I that's how I was feeling too but I think that that's why I was posing that question at the top of this discussion of was it supposed to be kind of this weird meta exploration of what is like disgusting lowbrow humor and and again like that idea of like looking into that infinity mirror of like bad humor being reflected back but then it's meta but but then it's still bad and still offensive but if you're doing it to like to point that out but it still exists, you know what I mean? Well, can I throw a can I throw a wrench in that real quick? Yeah. Because we can do this all day long and navel gaze and esoteric and try to intellectualify it yeah. all day. But ultimately also, Charlotte shitting in her pants is funny. Right, but I think what I'm talking about in particular is jokes that center around assault and jokes that center around well, I don't want to like <laughs> I don't know who's listening or who's who's got what what is you know makes anyone cuff, uncomfortable or whatever. I think I'm specifically talking about gross out humor that centers around cum and assault. Okay, so the cum made me laugh really hard mm-hmm. because at that point it was so over. That was for us the audience, mm-hmm. and as an audience member, I could take that and I thought that was hilarious. It wasn't that. It was really just the animal rape in front of a group of women who didn't know they were going to be seeing that. That was all it is. That's all it is. Can I ask you? It's a weird defensiveness of those people, and maybe they don't give a shit. Maybe I'm being defensive for no reason. It felt like a weird, like, it felt like a weird, like, don't simulate rape in front of a group of women who don't know you're going to be doing that as a joke. Right. And I... That's all. That's it. And I agree with that. I I agree with that. Um, I've got to ask, just out of curiosity, uh, as someone who is a huge fan and I'm referring to you, of Freddy Got Fingered, and specifically the scene that we were most, uh, you know, we had the most, like, butting of heads over was the, the scene with the horse. Mm-hmm. I didn't like it. It made me feel uncomfortable. It made me feel like, yeah, if it was shock for sh- shock's sake, sure, great, that's awesome. If it's shock for art's sake, sure, great, that's awesome. Um, still made me very uncomfortable. <laughs> so I'm curious... Is it just that there is a an audience that is there, that is physically in the space while it's being filmed, that, that separates it for you? Yes. So it doesn't matter like if an audience at home is exposed. No, because you can turn that off. You can walk out of the theater, and many people did. Mm-hmm. You can walk out of the theater, you can turn it off. You are in your safe space regardless. There's a difference between staging something offensive and saying hey, this is a fuck you and a punk fuck you to anyone who thought they were going to get a stupid three-beat comedy about following your dreams. Tom Green is saying, fuck those comedies, that time is over. Mm-hmm. Or you wanted a studio, uh, f- uh, wanted a gross-out comedy. Tom Green is saying, oh, you like your fart and dick jokes? What about jerking off a horse? What about swinging a baby around by an umbilical cord? Taking it to such an extreme place mm-hmm. that you are forced to confront like just the dirtiness of existing. Yeah, and and, and that, that's why because it's an audience who is safe, but when it's in real life in front of people who can't like, of course, there's a shock about seeing something in real life that just I just don't like traumatizing strangers. That's it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the like being I don't know maybe I'm an old man and again like Jackass does stuff that is very similar to this that I think is hilarious. I, I in general my... am a big defender of prank comedy. It was just that one staging. Yeah, I mean. I get what you're saying. 
Uh, anyone in the chat have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm curious if, <laughs> if anyone else has any other thoughts. We're moving but in circles. I think that just one more thing to like think about as far as like prank comedy or you know this type of this type of like uh, reality. <laughs> it is kind of like reality. Uh, is if you're if you're thinking like I don't like the idea of offending people or triggering potentially triggering them in real life, who's to say that like a man threatening to jump off a building isn't going to be triggering to them, right? Or that a uh, you know somebody with a fake gun isn't going to be triggering, or or like an ex a fake explosion, or you know. I don't know. You could No, I mean and there's like early in the movie, I'm sure very shocking when he accidentally puts his hand in the blender. Yeah. Um and also all those people leave. Not one of them hops the counter to try and pull his arm out of that blender. Yeah. Fucking cowards. All of you. <laughs> um Okay, so maybe I am being too much of an old man, to be honest. But I don't know. I'm just I'm just saying I'm just, you know I'm not gonna be one of those people that says, I'm just playing devil's advocate. <laughs> no, I didn't take you that way. I'm just saying like Maybe I am just being... I feel like at this point I feel talked into a corner because I... It was really just something about that ape joke that made me made me uncomfortable, but not because I was uncomfortable, because I felt like almost like you shouldn't do that to people. But maybe, as to your point, you can never tell. And if it's shock comedy and it's in the world, then those people are going to live. They're going to live another day. Maybe I'm being too sensitive. It's weird. I'm like, am I now, like, the bleeding heart liberal who's, like, being too liberal? Because I feel weirdly like uh, if this was a right-wing comic, then it would be decried. And so I'm like, I'm not sure where the standard actually falls because um, most of the time you see people, like, uh, angry at comedians for joking about assault. It's because those comedians are, like, Daniel Tosh, and we already kind of don't like them because they represent this sort of, like, uh, shock male white bro dude thing. Whereas Eric Andre is a legitimately genius voice. This movie is incredible. I would say 80% of it is like fucking top tier comedy. Eric Andre is one of the most powerful, important comedic voices of our time. And I absolutely adore him. Also, Tiffany Haddish crushed Tiffany Haddish is incredible. <laughs> so let's not let this like little like, is this right? Is this wrong? Maybe that's the point. Maybe this conversation yeah. is like getting back to the meta thing, just making us talk. And I typically hate the like, well, you're talking about it, therefore it has meaning. I think that's generally a cop out, but fuck it. 80% of this movie, I absolutely adored. It is sounding like I didn't like the movie. That's actually not the case. I really loved it. I would recommend this. If we're doing our thing, would you recommend it or not? Yes, I would recommend this to pretty much all fans of comedy. I will say that maybe I'm too sensitive to the depiction of what I deem to be assault. I think it is supposed to be so over the top that it's funny and unrealistic, but maybe I'm too hung up on that one thing. Across the board, I do believe that shaking up the status quo is something that art should con continuously be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my final word on the movie. Yeah, and I'd say uh, I would also recommend watching this movie uh, if you're a fan of comedy or, uh, you know, Borat, any of those style uh, films, but... Again, I thought that the first, the first part of the, the bookends of the film, I thought for me crushed it. The performances crushed it. Mm. The the uh, kind of the brains behind it, I thought were really great. The middle of the movie lost me a little bit, but overall, highly recommend. Very enjoyable watch, and it got us thinking. <laughs> it did, and I will say on the note of like sex comedy the finger trap bit was one of the funniest things i think i've seen in a movie in a long time i don't know if you thought that was the finger trap bit was funny or not but to me that's distinct because that's just penises are funny it's not like mm -hmm. there's nothing threat threatening about it mm -hmm. did you like that bit you didn't <laughs> did you <laughs> it wasn't my favorite <laughs> i guess we're just your mom and dad tonight jesus yeah i know we're lame now it wasn't my favorite we gotta go we gotta like comedy theaters open back up so we can see more stuff um, it's not that I disliked it. I don't know. I get yeah, whatever. There's there's a lot to unpack there, but uh, again, don't want to give too much away for people who haven't seen it. Uh, yes, I would say eighty percent. I think we're all. I think the consensus is that eighty percent of the movie was great. Twenty percent was kind of like take it or leave it. Uh, on a scale of take it or leave it to, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think that also like 
this movie does suffer from something that sometimes happens with comedies that have such high highs is like in a vacuum this movie is fantastic from start to front Mm -hmm. on its own merits it's hitting such high highs that when it's not giving you that serotonin of that constant like hurting to laugh you're going to judge it more harshly and i think that sometimes happens to all of us myself i'm very susceptible to that if i'm watching a comedy that kills me at times sometimes when it's just meandering a little bit more to get to its next plot point i feel that meandering more but it's actually a compliment to the movie because it did such a good job getting my expectations so high yeah and i i will say i haven't read anything on the internet about what people think about this movie i'm very curious same i haven't read a thing i'll I'll check it out but (laughs) um okay they almost actually got stabbed uh they almost actually got stabbed. I don't know what t- uh, moment in that uh, moment in the movie that is, but I would love to know uh, if that's on screen. Okay. All right. I am going to take a quick break, get myself some water, and maybe some caffeine, and let you do what you watch. This oh, week. when they ran into the barber shop. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was that was a scary moment. Yeah, yeah that guy came out ready, <laughs> ready to fight. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, all right, I'll be right back. All right, cool. So we are going to go ahead and move into the um, what did I watch real quick, which I'll rattle these off because we spent a lot of time on the front part of the stream. Uh, dang, y'all, we spent nearly two hours on the what did you watch. So I'm going to rattle through what I watched, give you my quick thoughts. If you want to join in, please do. But I want to get through New Arrivals and get to talking about Tetsuo uh, before it gets too late here. So, I watched the Zack Snyder Justice League. After finishing the entire thing, I will say my thoughts are, this is a very solid movie. I don't think it's fantastic. I don't think it's awful. I don't think it's the best movie ever. I don't think it's bad at all. I thought this was a very solid movie with a lot of really wonderful ideas, particularly in the action staging, the slow motion effects with the flash. Uh, super, super interesting. Zack Snyder is such a wonderful stylist. And I love the way he plays with time and uh, slow motion. It's kind of his thing, it's his trick. I love him doing his trick. Overall, still feel as though the DC Universe characters feel flatly sketched to me. I don't think I have a whole lot of depth from them other than they're gruff and things are sad. Um, And I do think that it was a little long in the tooth for what it was accomplishing. Awesome action, awesome fights. Um, I love Batfleck as usual. I dislike Henry Cavill's Superman, as usual. Um, I think it's a totally solid miniseries um, that is maybe being a little bit overhyped because of the amount of time it took to arrive. Um, So, solid recommendation. If you want a fun superhero movie, watch it. I also love the 4-3 aspect ratio. We've talked about that in depth. I watched a movie called The Last Warning. Uh, this is Paul Lenny's last movie. The Last Warning is about, um, well, actually, let me come back to that one real quick. Let me come back to that one real quick. Um, Tetsuo is in the God Ratio as well. Yes, I watched so much 4-3 stuff recently. Um, Last Warning is as well, but that's because it's a silent movie, and everything was in 4-3 before, uh, 1955, when, uh, widescreen was first introduced. I watched this very widescreen movie called Event Horizon. Um, This is the Shout Factory new 4K restoration of Event Horizon. Um, Had to see how it looked. Spoiler alert, it looks beautiful. Still one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, Just such a fun, such a fun sci-fi horror movie. Highly recommended to everybody, Event Horizon. Um, And then I watched 964 Pinocchio. 964 Pinocchio is a Japanese cyberpunk movie about sex slaves being indoctrinated and going insane uh, from 1993. It very much is part of the same movement of punk, handheld, crazy-ass technological horror of Tetsuo. What I thought was really interesting is the two have some overlap in terms of, like, particularly things coming out of human bodies being foamy and goopy. There is an extended vomiting sequence in 964 Pinocchio that really reminded me, it's vomiting in a subway uh, by a woman. It reminded me almost beat for beat of Possession, Zolowski's Possession. Um, I overall thought this was a really great movie about kind of like 
the corruption of the soul that can happen from power dynamics whereas Tetsuo is a little bit more afraid of modernity and industrial, uh, the industrial world removing our humanity. Pinocchio is about power removing our humanity in the sense that the main characters are brainwashed uh, sex slaves, and that is how they lose their mind. Um, Glow Cat, this, that movie is insane. It is indeed insane. I really dug it, although I do think that it pales in comparison to um, Tsukamoto, just on a technical filmmaking level. Um, I think Tsukamoto has a lot more to say, but I do think that 964 Pinocchio uh, is a really worthy watch that I would recommend to anyone looking for some fun cyberpunk Japanese weirdness. Um, all right. Then I said that I would talk about this one in a second. The reason I'm talking about The Last Warning next is because um, The Last Warning is... Uh, we talked about this as a new arrival last week. I watched it this week. Uh, Paul Lenny, one of my favorite... Um, German directors. This is his last movie from 1929, and it is about the story of a group of theatrical performers who are trying to put on a show, but the, the man who plays one particular role in the play dies at the same moment in the play every time. And they go through one guy, they start getting warning letters, they go through a second actor, he dies, they get more warning letters until they eventually get the last warning. And it's essentially a whodunit um, that takes place. It's a whodunit slasher from 1929 that takes place in the theater, which brings me to the Wattage. Which brings me to the movie I thought it would make a fantastic double feature of, and one that's part of our new arrivals this week: Stage Fright. Uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, one of Stephanie's favorite horror movies. Yeah. Um, this is Michele Suave, who directed Cemetery Man. Um, and uh, I love this movie. It is a chamber piece. A bunch of actors boxed into a theater at night uh, while a killer in an owl mask hunts them and they're locked in the theater and they can't get out. Um, these two would make a really excellent double feature. Last warning, uh, 78 minutes long. Also, The Last Warning, one of the most like modern uses of the camera from its decade, um, some truly amazing moving camera work. If you are someone who thinks of silent films as camera being down, uh, people overacting, and a lot of intertitles, um, you need to watch some stuff from the late 20s, particularly by my dude Paul Lenny. Man Who Laughs, the movie that's in, famously an inspiration for The Joker, same director, this man's visual style is off the charts. Um, the camera is moving and freewheeling like it's a digital camera. It's amazing. Um, and, and I'm just personally so into watching people do a lot with a little. Um, and given how large cameras were and what an innovation simply moving them was in the first place, um, incredible movie. Incredible movie that I hadn't seen before. New Arrival, Stage Fright. And we're going to maybe do some a little bit of a Italian horror Um also, uh, De La Morte De La More, same director. This is also called Cemetery Man. Rupert Everett is in this. One of my favorite movies in high school. This is an existential quandary of a horror movie about a night watchman at a cemetery where all the dead come back to life. But it's not played like a zombie horror movie at all. It is played very much like it's part of his day job. When someone gets buried, they come back to life. He shoots them in the head. He buries them again. He goes back to bed every single night. Um, however, he's soon visited by a woman who dies who uh, wants him for more than, well, she wants him for sex. And she awakens uh, the intersection between death, sex, and the meaning of life for him. A wonderful movie. Very, very much the most esoteric uh, Italian horror movie I think I've ever seen. And then finally, from the same director, Michele Suave, The Sect, which I have not seen. Very excited this also arrived. And we've got The Church coming this week as well. And then we're going to do a little yeah. Michele Suave uh, watch through. Hell yeah. One of my favorite directors. Final thing for the new arrivals is this nice edition of Fantasia that I overpaid for on eBay. It's $12 <laughs> on Amazon new and I bought it for 20 like a total simp. Um, Fantasia, uh, I've just really been enjoying ever since we got the 4K TV, watching hand-drawn animation on Blu-ray. Um, I made it about halfway through this this week until it got too late and I went to bed, but oh my god, it looks absolutely stunning. 
on this Blu-ray. Yeah. Uh, and truly, like... Really remarkable. <laughs> yeah. Truly a masterpiece. Like, truly Fantasia, like, one of the great works of the cinema. Unfortunately, some racist animation in it. I'm not just talking about the mushrooms. I'm talking about some of the nymphs um, who are blackface, and it's really unfortunate. Um, it's more than unfortunate. It's painful because this movie is so important, and I wish that everyone could watch it without it uh, being tainted in that way. But in terms of what Disney was doing at the time in 1940, the fact that this movie is 81 years old and looks like it does, the water animation, the multiplane mm -hmm. animation, the textures, the colors... Um, this is a landmark in American filmmaking and American an and animation uh, that is in many ways still untouched on its throne. Um, and, and if you think about 1940, the concept of the family film didn't exist for a long time because people used to go to the theater as kind of a nice night out on the town, much like you might go to the opera or the um, orchestra. And so Fantasia is meant to be a night out for adults, um, as are many Disney movies. And so sometimes when people are like, oh, wow, those old Disney movies like Pinocchio, Dumbo have some really scary stuff in them, or Fantasia, some really scary stuff, that's because no one was thinking about your children when they made it. They were thinking about you go get putting on your nice pea coat and your, your top coat and your, your top hat and your tails. <laughs> go getting around. on your nice top hat and your tails. That's right. <laughs> Anyway, uh, those are the new arrivals from this week, and I would love a ratio discussion. Um, yes, okay. Going back a little bit, too. Um, great job, nerds. Enjoyed Justice League a lot, but agrees with my assessment. Base characterization issues. Final sequences were very imaginative and epic superhero story levels. Absolutely. Um, I also loved that it was in 4.3 because it looks so gigantic. Um, we talked about this last week on ratio a lot how sometimes widescreen feels like it has more because it fills your TV, but it's actually matted from the full frame. You guys know this, you're photographers, Wedge and Great Job Nerds, but I love seeing the full frame, the full open frame. Um, and I think the reason, I said this last week, but in case you missed it or weren't here, I think the reason a lot of times that, in addition to our TV's size, that our brains think of 4.3 as small is because growing up it was. Growing up, 4.3 was a cropped in version of a widescreen movie. And so I think it's hard for members of our generation to think of 4.3 as being bigger than widescreen for that reason. Um, I also said this to Stephanie two weeks ago, last week on the stream, I'll say it one more time. I like to imagine what the aspect ratio world would have looked like had the television been invented a little bit later after widescreen took over. I think we would have had widescreen TVs uh, much earlier. Mm -hmm. um, reading on. Um, wasn't sure it was watching Tetzel in the right format. Realized it was the perfect claustrophobic ratio for a claustrophobic film. Um, agree. Um, and it does feel that way with the, they call it pillar boxing, to have the black bars on the side. But I, I find that if you just sit closer to your TV than your optometrist recommends, it's going to look big. It's going to look big. I'm just being <laughs> uh, Is that all for your new arrivals? That's all. Okay, great. Uh, I have one new arrival, which was a total stumble upon um, out in the wild, and that is this book, The Most of Nora Ephron. I can't... It's a little shiny there. What's, what is this? Is this paper? Is it a paper movie? It's a paper movie um, <laughs> that you see in your mind. Uh, uh, no, I, I was very happy to, to come across this, uh, most notably for... Uh, this is a collection of a lot of different works, uh, including short stories and fiction from Nora Ephron, but also the complete screenplay for When Harry Met Sally, which that's the reason I, I uh, picked this movie up, or picked this <laughs> paper movie up, this uh, AKA book, um, because I was standing in the bookstore, opened it right up to, uh, you know, the screenplay, and reading through immediately one was taken all over again uh by the dialogue which i just adore for y'all y'all that know me you know that when harry met sally is one of my favorite movies ever um but also how straightforward the direction is written in the screenplay um and not only that but how beautifully the screenplay translates to the film itself um, so I'm really excited to read through the whole thing. Um, you read that whole screenplay? 
when yeah. we finish it, we should rewatch the movie. Yeah. Unless you want to save it for New Year's again. Well, you know, I've seen it so many times. So many times. <laughs> um, but yeah, a really beautiful book. Look at these beautiful colors. Look at that. Look so at gorgeous. this. Look at that face. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love um, her. Just, I'm just excited to dive into this. Um, yeah. It's amazing. Did she write this or is this a biography? Uh, it is a collection of her writing. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah. Cool. I love when they do this on hardbacks too with the paper. I love when they stagger the Me lengths too. of the paper. Me Very satisfying. Too. All right, that's my only new arrival. And you actually, I think we have some fun new arrivals coming soon. Ooh. I don't know if the mail came here today. Um, it's such a good movie. It says Abby Wedge. What movie? We're talking about too many. Oh, with Harry and Sally. I mean, that makes sense. <laughs> and also, it, when you said get in your horse and carriage, it made me think of the scene that I flipped, that I just opened up the book in the bookstore. Is the scene where they're in Sharper Image and they're singing along to the karaoke machine, um, the soundtrack of Oklahoma. Uh, oh, right. Talking about getting in their, their buggy. The and Surrey with the fringe on top. The Surrey with the fringe on top. Mm -hmm. Oklahoma. Um. Amazing. Harry Met Sally. Cool. Good to agree more. Shall we get over to Movie Club? We shall! Movie Club! Movie Club. Alright. I need a little water break. Take some... Well, let's go ahead and Take do this real quick. Will break. you do us a favor and summon the movie poster? Yeah. You don't... Oh. He's gonna... You want to summon it right above your head oh. to the left here. <laughs> Wait, Stephanie, what are you doing? Uh, uh, what are you doing, Stephanie? Whoa, look at this. Oh. Let's see if I can get that. Whoa. Look at that. Whoa. Look at that. Hey, Stephanie. Ready to talk about this movie club pick? <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Enough fun with that. Y'all, this week we watched Hydrate. Thank you, Vanit. <laughs> um, I will go ahead and give you this and this as the talking sticks. Ah, yes. All right. Uh, first of all, sound off in the chat if you watched Movie Club this week. Um, I love that scene too, Wedge. Um, I think Adam and myself kind of had similar immediate takeaways uh, at first. I was being maybe too analytical watching through this movie. I was thinking like, what does it all mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? Um, and I was like, oh, this is a movie about um, guilt and about paranoia and about drug use. And I was like, you know, just sort of trying to unpack everything as I went along. And then I had this moment where I was like, maybe this movie isn't really isn't really it's about nothing and everything at the same time but it's also feels like a movie about i think you had a different a different uh i'll let you get to your right, right. your wording but my my thought was that it's you know a movie about like the loss of a moral compass or this feeling of like um the evilness within i love that um, I, I think I agree with literally everything you said. Like, like you said, we we had kind of we try not to over talk movies uh, to save the discussion for this, but we did both kind of have that immediate. Uh, here, I'll take one. Uh, we did both kind of have that immediate feeling of when we talked about it. Like for the first part, watching through it, being like, uh, is this um, about drug use? Is this about uh, particularly when he starts to lose himself and? Uh, starts to threaten her with his giant drill penis um particularly about like is this about drug use or is this about abuse or like the wretchedness of like masculine energy coming out and being uh terror then i said to myself maybe not everything has to have uh maybe throw the fucking semiology out the window maybe not everything has to be a symbol with a referent and something that is referring to maybe this is not metaphorical maybe it is metonymic um, and metonymic is a word, it's a fun film school word that just means 
instead of uh, a, whereas a metaphor would be something being uh, maybe an idea stand and sim symbolic metonymic would be using the name of something to refer to its part in this case the word machine to refer to all systems of machinery the man the man exactly <laughs> um, and so I think there's a lot going on uh, it doesn't surprise me to know or to learn uh, as I recently did that apparently Sukumoto is thought of as a very warm empathetic kind man who's really fun to work with yeah and i think that's something that we also bonded on uh right after the movie was despite how crazy all over the place violent and you know dark this film was there was like a weird humanist uh chewy center <laughs> <laughs> literally yeah with a hard exterior of metal yeah um now going back to the whole idea of what if um, sorry, I, I hid my, I hid it right here on top. Here she is. Going back to the what if um, this movie doesn't have exact symbols? What if it is metonymic in the sense that it is all about the different machinery of everything? However, beyond that, I think it's a very Western way of looking at things critically to say this means this. This character represents temptation. This character is your Satan. This is your hero, etc. Blah blah blah. I think it is a much more Japanese ethos to say, mm, doesn't matter. It's about the vibe. It is about the feeling you get. It is about what these images create in your mind, not about what I think the images mean. To that note, I kept thinking of this quote, which is on the back of this box for this movie called Organ. Uh, this movie's from 1996. Um, it's kind of a video nasty, but I remember, I'll be honest with you, I rented this from I Love Video in Austin during Halloween a few years ago, precisely because I wanted to watch something infamously fucked up and gory. Instead, I got a movie that I thought was like actually a pretty intellectual weird art film that was also disgusting and gory. <laughs> um, the quote on the back of this is from the director, and she says, I wanted to describe the agony of a wounded soul of someone decaying from the inside which I, I think of as like decay of the soul. So my literal thought watching Tetsuo was, maybe it's not symbolic, maybe it's just a depiction of the decay of the soul. Then the credits roll, and I notice that the woman who plays Tetsuo's love interest slash the, the, the woman in the movie is Kei Fujiwara, and I think is Kei, Kei Fujiwara is the director of Oregon whose quote is on the back about the decay of the soul. So it's very much vibe. Of course they're talking. She did that year, about seven years before she went off and directed Oregon on her own. So of course there's that connection of exploring that, which then is balanced out even more by the fact that our main character, Tetsuo, is referred to in the credits as Salary Man, um, not as Tetsuo, because he is simply a cog in a machine. So there's a few different things here. Uh, right off the bat, that sort of like modern industrial world fears. We've talked about this before with the 80s and the 90s, but I do think that Tetsuo is very forward thinking. I don't think Tetsuo is predicting the rise of internet culture and kind of the cyborg element that would come from the mind, but in terms of the decay of the body, a very Cronenberg video drone, which I think is the same release year, mm -hmm. um, like literally being ground down by the machine until you are nothing but kind of this dehumanized completely consumed instrument of capitalist destruction the ending then with our love could destroy could our love could destroy the entire world that that offers itself up to a few other readings here uh one of them being the idea that these men are merged as part of a capitalistic masculine thing that truly can turn the world steel and rust or is it a queer reading or is it the fact that the woman who kind of throughout the entire movie represents this fleshiness, as you pointed out, flowers, spring, earth. Yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll pass it back to you before no, I no, go off on my tangent you're, here. You're fine. I would, the, the only thing that I would just quickly piggyback off on that is, yeah, I, I was, uh, we were discussing last night how um, when she transforms, what she is uh, infected with or, you know, imbued with is a, a, something very earth earthly it's uh flowers it's bubbles i think mm -hmm. like something that feels very organic and very round and fluid and and of nature and i do think it's interesting that the the other 
guy that the, he merges with at the end, continuously towards the end of the movie, is picking up dirt. Hmm. That's a good point. I don't know if that is intentional or not, but it seemed like a merging of those two He's also inside of her the entire time. Yeah. The other guy's inside of her. Yeah. Which is the other thing, like, she becomes infected by his presence when she picks up the living, the living piece of metal in the subway. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's also the potential for a queer reading here of what he is attracted to in this woman is the masculine energy that's inside of her that he then pushes and pushes until he eventually destroys and liberates so that he can be with the man. Mm. In the end, our love can destroy the world because there is actually that love, and she is a casualty of that. Um, oh, interesting. I thought the woman in the subway was a different character. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought the... Uh, well... What, is, what are y'all's... Uh, what, are, what are y'all's... Um, Thoughts on that? I mean, not thoughts, but does anyone know without us IMD being it? Um, see, I thought the woman on the subway was. Um, I thought the woman on the subway was our main character, was Kei Fujiwara, our main mm. character woman. And that she was somehow infected by that because in the rest of the movie, whenever he like hugs her, you see the other guy like rattling inside the cage of her body. Right. Like trying to come out. Yeah. Trying to come out, and he wants to be with that man, and that's ultimately when. There's also that very beautiful romantic moment when they're fighting at the end and they suddenly become just their human, human? selves yeah. floating. That was really beautiful. Um, so I, I do think that that reading is totally there. Um, I wrote down men, metal, women, flesh, and then piggybacked on what you said, women, earth. Mm -hmm. And I love that idea that he's trying to connect with the earth, mm -hmm. but maybe because of the expectations of being a salary man, he can't have a connection to that. Right. Um, so yes, uncovering... Uh, okay, so... Yes, I wrote, does it have to be symbolic or can't it be hyper-representative? Um, because I like the term hyper-reality as a thing to describe some film techniques. I would describe this as hyper-real um, in that every aspect of lived experience is dialed up in it. I mean, technically, this movie is incredible. Like, the stop motion, oh, the yeah. patience behind it. Really amazing. Really, really amazing. So much going on. So many ideas. Yeah, which again comes us back to the like, is it about a man struggling with his sexuality? Is it about a man who's uh, drug addicted? Is it about the plight of the salary man being ground down by the workaday culture of Japan, uh, nine to five life? Is it a is it a monster movie? Is it about? And I wrote down Doctor Jekyll or Wolfman because there's obviously a Frankenstein thing here, but he is and he is Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster at the same time. The reason I had my mind in that universal pocket is because the movie starts with a production company credit to Kaiju Films, mm -hmm. followed by a subtitle that says, A Normal Sized Monster Movie. Uh, kind of a, a silly little joke at the word Kaiju there, but I thought, well, who is he then? Is he Dr. Jekyll, who's addicted to a drug and becomes Mr. Hyde? Kind of. Is he a wolf man in, the se in a very similar sense of there's something hiding in him, which could also represent sexuality or... Uh, something tethered by rules, maybe. Shout out Lil Nas X on mm -hmm. uh, that, by the way, which I could talk about too, but mm -hmm. we're running late in the show. Um, or is he Frankenstein? Um, or is it just all of them? Um, I, I just like the idea that it is a monster movie. Uh, and monster movies typically are about some sort of societal fear we have. I think the fear element of this is being consumed, subsumed by the machine. But the weird hope there is that maybe there's our new home is in the machine. And isn't that hopeful and horrific at the same time? Mm -hmm. Let's see what's going on in the chat. Um, I love that Gullicat said thing they like most about it is the fact that everyone has their own tape and even Sukumoto won't open up about what he was trying to say. Very David Lynch not talking about Eraserhead vibes there. Um, yeah, which this this movie did give me Eraserhead. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kind of like a racer head. Uh, you were saying. Um, Sorry, I want to know when racer head came out. Seventy seven. Wow, eleven years earlier. Yeah, definitely had that kind of vibe, and like you were saying, monster movie. A little bit of like the fly for me. The fly. That's what you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. And then like a, like an eighties uh, uh, music video. 
Uh-huh. Felt like a like a zombie music video. <laughs> it also very much felt like a. Uh, Another thing I like about this movie is well let's let's no I'm gonna get my thought out and then we'll move back to the chat. Um, another thing I really like about it is it is esoteric. It has a lot to say. It is also technically crazy and extremely well thought out on a technical level. It is not amateurish in the least, even though it's super low budget. Um, it's also super punk rock. It's also yeah. super youthful. It has a youthful energy. The soundtrack is rock and. I think that a lot of these visuals directly went on to inspire uh, Nine Inch Nails, Tool, a lot of industrial totally. rock in the 90s in America. Totally. And the, and the music as well, the soundtrack as well. Which then very much like, is funny because Japanese pop culture is so influenced by American rock music and hip hop. Mm-hmm. And I, I love I, I love the interplay between Japanese and American culture. Um, like, I, I do think there is some... There's always danger of cultural appropriation, but when it comes to pop culture, I feel like Japan and the U.S. are like, I'm going to copy everything you do, because I like you, because you're cute, because you're fun. I just love the little flirty vibe that artists have with each other across these two uh, countries. Glowcat agrees this movie's very queer. Uh, mm-hmm. Wedge says Which that makes sense. A takeaway we both, immediate takeaway we both had as well. Wedge has the same question we had. Uh, what's the scene where the guy's hitting him with the steel bar? Yeah, yeah, and I was, uh, so, I was thinking, my gut was saying that it was like a weird, uh, drug moment, but then afterwards I was like, I don't know if that's correct, because it seems to me like somebody who's having a hallucinogenic bender, and then something actually kind of bizarre happens, and then it's, it feels very like, uh, you know, what is reality? Is is that guy just another guy, unhinged guy, like, out in the world? Or And why is he able to overpower these, like, why is he able to beat him within an inch of his life after they're having this epic battle? Yeah. Um, I think there is, I love, I love your reading that it might look like what an encounter with a stranger, a, an, an aggressive stranger could look like on drugs. Mm-hmm. I also think it could potentially be with the steel pipe and the... <laughs> huge amount of phallic imagery in this movie Mm -hmm. could be an allusion to a bad sexual experience in public if we're going with the queer reading and you want to think that maybe Tetsuo is exploring that with strangers um, as he's trying to come out and he has a scary uh, experience with an older man it could also be um, just this kind of like every man has this metal and every man has this violence and uh, maybe it doesn't matter who you are maybe we all carry it inside of us um, in terms of your other question, Wedge, uh, what is Tetsuo's story of how he got obsessed with putting the iron in the leg? There's a lot of photos of Jesse Owens um, floating around. And there's this idea, it's funny, like Get Out explores this too, the idea of sci-fi allowing the body to get to a point where like Jesse Owens being this like example of man at his man as machine. Jesse Owens' uh, record in the Olympics um, described as a machine there's even an animatrix um segment about someone who runs so fast they wake themselves up from the matrix and so i think there is a lot about like the bot when is the body more machine like than that and i think there is a I, I think you could see that as a metaphor if you want for a perception or for a quest of the uh, platonic ideal of being a productive efficient worker it could also be the desire to have technology remove the flaws of the body Maybe the female character is there to uh, force us to look at the body. The way that she vomits all of that foam stuff. Super, like I said, uh, like 964 Pinocchio, also like possession. I think there's a tradition in shock art cinema of women regurgitating something that looks biological, but not like it should come, not like we know what it is. And I think that is, I do think that's a metaphor for pain all over I, this movie's all over the place mm-hmm. um burst city okay i'm gonna write that down burst city because you've recommended it but i did not remember it last time my apologies um shogo ishii i did have written down because i but anyway you're making me very much want to see that great industrial soundtrack reference to having some metal stuck in his head maybe it was from that attack that's the other thing like is the metal stuck in his head from that attack is the car accident. Uh, clearly the car accident sets things off. 
is this death? Did he die in the car accident? Is this hell? Huh, that's interesting. Does it matter? <laughs> Sorry. I just thought, I thought it was like the couple killed someone in the car, right? I thought he was hit by the car. That's interesting, because I thought that the couple killed someone in the car, and it's hmm. about guilt, and the infection is, like, the guilt and all of the people he sees, like, in the subway and whatever is, like, the paranoia of everyone knowing, um, and she gets infected with it, too. They're both infected, but in different ways by the guilt of killing someone, and when they, like, the visual you see of somebody looking up at them having sex is the body in the grave that they buried together that's a fascinating read i did not think that they were the drivers i thought they were very much the victim but perhaps oh. i'm completely wrong i thought they were the drivers does anyone know uh the businessman tosses the businessman hit the metal fetishist then the business woman businessman tosses the body in the woods you're right mm -hmm. i completely missed that well, that's, and I think your read is probably accurate then. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> so that's why I thought it was, especially towards the beginning of the film, when they're saying, when she, uh, on the phone, she says, I haven't been the same since the car accident. I read that as the, the guilt is like eating them alive. Literally. Through the, mm -hmm. you know. It's interesting. The, Tet I was mixed up here because Tetsuo and the salary man are different. Um, and I always want to call the metal fetishist Tetsuo. Or yes, it is Tetsuo. Okay, so Yeah. Still alive. he was still alive, he watched them. He's the one who comes after him later because the metal fetishist fell in love with the man and they and in the end they are together. Yeah. So Tetsuo gets hit by the couple who then celebrate by fucking with an eye shot of him. Yeah, all right. which is why there are, like, all those flashes. So I just, like, had, like, went into my own, like, zoned-out brain for a second and missed, like, a three-minute chunk that, rat that explained a portion of this plot. Um, yeah, that's guilt, says Wedge. Mm. Fascinating. Okay, so let me make sure I got the plot of this movie right. <laughs> um, I think that I've always mixed them up in my head. See, that's why I thought the woman in the subway was different. I thought that that was an example of paranoia. Mm, maybe. But I could be wrong. Now I'm a bit confused. But uh, yeah, that's that was that was like my my reading of uh, what was happening there with the infection growing. Metal fetishist played by Sukamoto. Woman in Glasses, you're right, Woman in Glasses is different from Kei Fujiwara, who plays woman. They are different. I thought that was a that was a moment of, surely everyone knows what I've done. Surely everyone can see the blood on my hands. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. him being chased by her is like the beginning of his, uh, I guess like, if you want to look at it as a, a psychotic break fueled on by drugs, that's sort of like the moment that it really starts taking off. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the woman in glasses and Tamara Wowu Taguchi, who plays the salary man, are one couple. Mm -hmm. And Tetsuo, played by the director Shinya Sukamoto, and the woman, that's what her name is, and the, this credited name as woman, is Kei Fujiwara, mm -hmm. or the other couple. So you're right. I mixed them up. Mm, okay. So that's why. So indeed. Uh, Tetsuo is the metal fetishist, and the businessman is just the businessman. Correct. So for <laughs> some reason, I got them mixed up like halfway through, but that all tracks. It's crazy. They gave one character glasses to help me and everything. <laughs> but when you're moving the camera that fast and it's in that <laughs> high of a contrast Chioscoro, baby, well, I'm going to miss something. Glowcat says it's a confusing movie, LOL. It's not straightforward, <laughs> it's which true. I think we've established. <laughs> <laughs> Way more established. In any case, um, if you by any chance didn't watch this or haven't watched it, 
Um, I'm a huge Tsukamoto fan in general. I'm actually going to go ahead and self-promote slightly. Um, because I have a music video that was... Um, very, very influenced by this movie. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop it in the chat. So I mentioned that after we watched it. I said, I can see how you... For that music video and as well, some portions of Dropping Evil, I could see how you were influenced by it. Yeah, stop motion magnificence. Water. But yes, I, uh, I made a music video. I actually made a 10-minute art film called Cycle One 10 years ago. That is a looping video. Uh, and then I sampled from that and sped up the cutting to make this music video. The music video is a faster way to digest it, more entertaining too. In any case... If you haven't seen it, I'm a huge Tsukamoto, um, Tsukamoto fan across the board. I would also really recommend uh, Gemini, uh, which is a really... Uh, Gemini and Dead Ringers, if you want to watch a couple movies. Uh, cre creepy Twins, one by Tsukamoto, one by Cronenberg. A, that's a double feature for you right there. I just came or up with and I think it's... a quadruple feature. Oh my god, I love it. Um, <laughs> also by Tsukamoto, uh, Tetsuo 2 is fantastic. Uh, Tetsuo 2 uh, Body Hammer is awesome. It's in bright colors. Um, so kind of flipping the script there and then um, Hiroku the Goblin is a really fun one that Fangoria put out over here that's a little monster movie about a little if you like like thing style effects there's a spider head in it um, what else by him um, Bullet Ballet Bullet Ballet really great um, another movie kind of about the ennui of being stuck in a system however much more about like heartbreak Bullet Ballet is um, so yeah uh, I would say I recommend this to everybody. I think Tetsuo is a masterpiece, one of the most important art films uh, ever, and I'm so happy it's so popular um, because it deserves to be. Mm -hmm. I could not agree more. I highly recommend watching this um, for like not only context of clearly everything that it has influenced, but also just the fact that it's really a really interesting film with a lot to say and and a lot of like fascinating visuals um yeah i thought it was great well sounds like we both recommend it this week why yes why yes that mean, well we are almost at the end of our show uh, i think keeping this in the two and a half hour pocket feels good yeah we've had streams go for like four hours before yeah so whatever it can go long we did go off the rails a little bit at the top of the stream. But. We did. <laughs> did we? I mean... I feel like we didn't. Did we? No. I don't know. We just talked about... We talked about Star Trek and Sex and the City for a while. <laughs> it's a video store. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> Nothing's off topic unless it's books. I gotta say, I, I just looked down at this and I gotta say, I'm really happy this was our pick. Yeah, I it's think so that, good. I think maybe... Was... Did Glowcat kind of... Pushed us push, towards this, yeah. It? Well, thank you. I'm very happy I watched that. Yeah, me too. It's been a while. It's been a while for me. Um, and I also just, you know, after this, uh, I wish that Arrow just made more of their stuff because it's absurd that this is so hard to find. Like this is like three hundred dollars now. It should not be. I got this for sixty five because I ordered it when it came out because I was like, oh my god, a Sukumoto box set. Someone did it. Because I was like, holy shit, this guy's finally getting some re respect. Um, <laughs> Another one that's really fun to watch by him is um, The Adventure of Denshu Kozo, Denshu Kozo, which I think also, I think literally translates to The Adventure of um, Metal Rod Boy. It's the movie he made before Tetsuo uh, that's very short. It's his short film about a guy who has an electric metal rod sticking out of his back who conducts electricity. Uh, it's, it's where he started on a lot of those stop motion effects. It's really fun. Mm. It's not nearly as serious. It's very much a comedy. Um, if you see me smiling over your shoulder, it's because uh, Great Job Nerd said it's not paper movies, though, which made me giggle. <laughs> <laughs> and Wed just saying it's kind of the point, which, of course, it is. Mm -hmm. My wife. No! <laughs> I refuse to let that make me giggle every time. All right, y'all. Well, you know what will make me giggle is picking <laughs> a movie club pick. So I got some ideas on what might be a good movie club pick following up on this. You've got some good ideas on what might make a good movie club pick following up on this. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, uh, here's the little list I made of stuff we talked about throughout the night. Um, whether or not we want to follow down some Italian horror, which we've been talking Ooh. about. However, i got to say, 
Uh, as much as I want to dive into this Italian horror, we have been talking about Japan for a while. Yeah. And we could keep the Japan deep dive up. Um, from here, there's a few options. Let me just see here. Um, and, well, that's one that maybe not everyone has access to. Um, okay. So it depends on if we want to go down the route of Japan or... Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. um, it's a shorter one. What if I made a different reaction to everything you wrote, but it was all just absurd? It was all just... I was like... <gasps> <gasps> no! Snurp! Oh! Klingar! Wow! Chim Chim! Wow. Okay, well here, I'll just <laughs> rattle this off real quick. Stephanie, if there's anything I didn't write down. This looks pretty pretty in line with what we've talked about and where my head's at too so yeah Word. well instead of trying to read through the chat at the end of every episode and figure out what we were talking about because my brain's tired uh, i'm just gonna write down as we go so here's what i have from the top of the episode throughout as possible movie club ideas if anything else stands out to you holler uh first of all the shop around the corner uh that'd be a pretty big diversion uh but ernst lubitsch comedy uh remade later as you've got mail Silence of the Lambs, because we got into Hannibal talk. Silence of the Lambs being one of the best movies ever made. Um, always happy to rewatch that. However, we've probably all seen it. Promising Young Woman, if y'all want to try a new release. Uh, Closer, if we're feeling like some Mike Nichols. Uh, Vanit said he'd love to rewatch it. We also talked about Michele Suave and Italian Horror. We have both been chomping at the bit to watch Demons for a while now. We also watch Cemetery Man, which I uh, just need everybody to watch. Uh, on the subject of scary twins, like Tetsuo, Gemini, or just Cronenberg in general, if we let Tetsuo lead us there, Dead Ringers, Cronenberg's Dead Ringers, one I've been wanting to watch for a while and show you. Mm -hmm. If we continue down the Japanese route, we have Studio Ghibli. We could kind of merge... Uh, the fact that we got into some punk cinema this week with the anime we watched last week and do Studio Ghibli. I know Kiki's Delivery Service, I think, came out the same year as Tetsuo. Might be fun to flip the coin on what was happening in Japan at the time. Mm. Uh, from, you know, dark, grimy art film to uh, box office smash animation. Uh, Cure is the director of Pulse. I've talked about this before on here. Cure, a.k.a. Kuya. Um don't know what the accessibility is like on that i had to order a blu-ray from britain to be able to watch it so it might be off the books for us and then finally if we want to go truly formalist japan and really do some film history work we could always uh pop in seven samurai or throne of blood or any other uh kurosawa movie that we'd like to talk about What's because Tetsuo too? it's a great it's a great spot to start tetsuo too as well we haven't done a sequel to sequel yet yeah uh did we ever learn how to make a, uh, a survey? <laughs> yeah, we do. It's poll. Um, let's see here. Would you like to take a survey? Wedge, do y'all remember that? Wedge is... <laughs> no, what is that? I think it's from Animaniacs or... Is it Animaniacs? That there's, makes sense. There's a character that I was like, was always like, would you like to take a survey? Would you like to take, would you like to take a survey? Survey <laughs> Um. ring a ding ding would you like to take a survey? I'm also just, oh, you know what? Ah, oh, shit. I wonder if this would be a good one if we do. Oh, yeah. Japan. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, I'm kind of looking here, trying to refresh my brain. Also, there is a Japanese movie that I got at the last Criterion sale that is kind of celebrated as um, an art film for the Times. So many. Okay. Oh, Jesus. Oh, that's right. Oh, man. I'm opening my brain now. Sometimes you just gotta look at the shelf. <laughs> Seriously. But that would be a little. Mm, check out now. Mm, here. Her. Oh, my goodness. How many options are you pulling? I'm Japan's a big country with a long story film past, and I want us to have options if we truly want to learn about Japanese cinema. Okay, y'all. 
Wedge, Wedge just wants to watch something he hasn't seen before. I love that. More Japan watching Akira this week just because. Um, totally down with more Japan, and that's what I've pulled. In fact, one of the movies that I pulled as a kind of watched is indeed Akira. Um, I am I have like a half hour left in this. I decided uh, not to um, list it as something I watched this week, um, but I will definitely have finished Akira by next week and have thoughts too. That was me kind of being pulled towards. Uh, it was mentioned last week, but also the name Tetsuo, uh, the fact that we just watched some anime, and the fact that Akira was made the year, um, either the year before, no, the year after Tetsuo. So these two movies came out back to back. They both explore uh, the corruption of the body through technology uh, in a way that very much feels like Japanese artists trying to warn against uh, the dehumanizing lifestyle of business. Okay. VHS copy of Akira from the Sci-Fi Channel. If that wins, I'll watch that. I love that. Um, here are some, here are some ideas for Japan. I will humbly submit these. Um, Akira is not off the table, although, um, I don't know. I, I suppose Akira could be on the table if you feel like rewatching it. I will say this Blu-ray looks amazing. Um, okay. There's a director named Shohei Imamura, who I really love. Um, because Shohei Imamura is capable of doing exploitation as well as drama. Um... Vengeance is Mine is the true life story of a crime spree from a thief, murderer, etc. Um, more than a true crime tale, Vengeance is Mine bears humanity's snarling id. This is a kind of procedurally violent, um, almost gangster movie feel of a true story about a man who went on a crazy crime spree in the 70s. Uh, this movie is from 1979. It is that story. Uh, it's brutal, uncompromising, but also super fucking hip. Um, very hip, very fun. Um, really, like, almost kind of like Tarantino vibes. You can see the influence. Um, on the other side, Shohei Imamura's Black Rain. This is a very tragic, sad, um, post-World War II story of atomic fallout and is about generational reconciliation with um, trauma. If you want to talk about more genera generational trauma, um, High and Low. Uh, Great Job Nerds actually gifted me this Blu-ray. If you like Parasite, uh, High and Low is um, something you should absolutely watch. Uh, it's a, it's a um, what am I trying to say, hostage, uh, kidnapped child hostage thriller, um, a ransom thriller that is very much about the high class and the low class and their accessibility um, uh, to each other. Kurosawa, Throne of Blood, Macbeth. I'll always pitch this one. Um, been pitching this for a while. Female Prisoner 7-0 on Scorpion, Meiko Kaji. Uh, great balance of uh, women in prison exploitation and legitimate like art house uh, staging and kabuki staging influence there. And then if we want to keep doing experimental, uh, this is considered one of the great art house movies of the 60s from Japan. I've never seen it. Woman in the Dunes. I bought this at the last Criterion sale because I was so uh, interested in it. And then, of course, I always forget Seijun Suzuki, but we could also watch a Seijun Suzuki movie like Branded to Kill or um, Tokyo Drifter, which are also really, like, fun pop. Um, uh, it's uh, Suzuki movies like Drifted to Killer, Branded, Branded to Kill or T Tokyo Drifter. Imagine um, Godard doing a uh, Japanese gangster movie, and you got it. They're very fun. They're very... They're very cool. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, options of plenty. <laughs> I also still have that tin box DVD of Akira. So good. Oh, maybe I gave that to you, Rage Out Nerds. Maybe not. Maybe I still have my copy. It's a lot of options. So I guess what I'm asking is like... Would you like to take a survey? <laughs> would we like to take a survey? Do you want to know more about any of them? Or what's the vibe? Do we want something serious, something action-y? I got to use the restroom real quick. It but, seems uh, like everyone is sort of saying, feeling very good with the flow this cool. week. Okay, well, Woman in the Dunes is two and a half hours long, and it's an erotic battle of the senses depicting everyday life as a nightmarish Sisyphean struggle. So, <laughs> there's that one. Uh, show me how to make a, a, a pole, and I'll make a pole while you... 
I'll make a pole. Now pull it up and go. It's a pulley now. There you go. Um, I think you only. I think we only get five choices. Okay. So I'll go ahead and nix. Um, I'll go ahead. I feel like no one wants Throne of Blood. Maybe they do. Oh, here, instead of instead of doing this just right, Kurosawa. Okay. That's one of the options. Here, I'll... Yeah. Kurosawa as those, and then um, Tokyo Drifter. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how much I mess this up. Or get it right. <laughs> All right, let's see. It seems like we've got a little bit of interest in Akira. And... Oh, I'm not going to spell this right. And I'll tell the, the, the puppy king to sit with me. Sweet, special, sensitive baby dog you are, huh? Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah, I didn't stuff this not Japan. Well, I had just added that, but I can take it out. You want to finish this up? Sure. smells awful, dog. It's very bad. Oh, wow, that's really bad. Do you think that one or this one? I think that one. All right. Movie clear. Movie clear. <laughs> All right, y'all. It is up. Let me quickly scan through. Not Black Rain with Michael Douglas. Um, it is Black Rain um, from Imamura. The Black Rain Michael Douglas is, wait for it, Wait for it, Wedge. A Ridley Scott movie. Did you know that? Well, now you do. Um, no, this is uh, that's an action movie, also set in Japan. Uh, this Black Rain is the story of a family succumbing to radiation sickness in the years after Hiroshima. A family who survived the bomb but does not survive the fallout. Um, Hidden Fortress, I still haven't seen either, um, which is definitely something I have to watch. Any of the, if we pick Kurosawa, any of those, um, any of those are on the table, and then we can do a follow-up poll. We've only got one vote, y'all. So the poll is up. Only got one vote so far, baby bears. <laughs> Little baby bears. I don't even care. Little baby bears. No, I don't even care. Little baby bears. Am I bleeding again from where I cut myself shaving? No. Good. It hurts. It looks like it hurts. It's painful. <laughs> it, it hurts. It's I, I cut myself shaving and I was like, did I get an extra wrinkle? Because I was like going over a part I thought was smooth and there was like a little bump. And then here's the kicker. I went back to finish shaving next to it very carefully and did it again and just opened it up. That's why it bled so hard. Yeah. Bad. It looks like you. It looks like you got through a dermis. Yeah, I did get through a dermis. Um, yes, yes, it is very sad. Black Rain is very sad. Um, in fact, it's a ta it's a VHS tape that I had been taking around with me everywhere I moved for years, um, because I got it from the old video store I worked at, and uh, I was like so intent on saving it. 
And then uh, Arrow went ahead and put it out on Blu-ray, so I snagged that. Um, now I have that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it looks like Vengeance is Mine is currently winning. Uh, Vengeance is Mine is a killer movie, literally. It's a real fun one. I haven't voted. You haven't voted. But it'll be obvious what I pick. Oops. Well, you just announced it, so. That'll be obvious. What? You said I haven't voted, but it'll be obvious what I pick. Wait, what are you going to pick? Well, it'll be obvious once the survey changes. No, I know. I did, That's why I'm saying you snitched on yourself by saying I haven't voted. <laughs> you could have just done it. <laughs> held the phone low and no one would have known. All right, well, I'm going to say that I was, instead of voting, I'll just say it. Uh, I think Vengeance is Mine is my pick as well. All right. Okay, y'all. Well, this should be a new one for most of us. For me, it's like a... 15 years ago. I remember loving this movie. I hope that I didn't steer us wrong, but I think we'll dig it. It's called Vengeance is Mine. You can probably find it on Prime. I know it's on the Criterion channel, uh, which might make it on Hulu as well. Um, but this is essentially the story of a man who went on a crime spree. And I think that for us in particular, Stephanie, it'll be a really good follow-up to Falling Down. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Cool. All right. The dog is letting us know that it's, in fact, dinner time and the end of our stream. <laughs> so, um, just want to say thanks for tuning in again, y'all. We'll be back next week. Yeah. Um, What's your movie? Oh, What's shit, we got to do staff picks. Um, I have that. I have, I had one written down. I wanted to get my staff pick. <coughs> you first. You first. Ooh. Oh, no, my staff pick's Dead Ringers. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Let's see. I'm a little torn between uh, two. So pick A or B. A. All right. My staff pick is It Happened One Night. It's already been your staff pick. No. No. It has not. It's been my staff pick. It has? Yeah. Aww. Right? Oh. I've definitely <laughs> downloaded that poster to make our art with. Wait, where's my phone? Hop on the gram real quick. Here, let me let me double check. It, I mean, it's totally whatever. Make it make it. Do y'all know that's been? Oh, hey, hold on. Where's my Now both of the animals are saying. Is it oh my god, the cat has really lost his damn mind since being out here. Oh my god, I could have sworn that it was my staff pick. It's been neither of ours? That's insane. How is it not? I don't know. I think we've discussed it before. Maybe. That's crazy. But we were talking about the shop around the corner. We were talking about Nora Ephron. And it just sort of made me think why I love that movie. Man, I swear that we've done it, but I don't care because it's a perfect film. It's so good. It's, it's up there. Uh, fun idea for a community pick. Closer. Yeah, I like that idea. The awkward moment when you arrive right when the stream is in. <laughs> I hold the book. Totally all right. We're going to go ahead and hop off because our animals are testing our low blood sugars right now. <laughs> so let me go ahead and type up the picks so everyone has them. You can also follow us on Instagram at you are in a video store um, in case you need to... Uh, in case you need to check in on what they are later. So, movie club pick for the week is Vengeance is mine. My staff pick is uh, Dead Ringers. And Stephanie's staff pick is It Happened One Night. And then community pick is Closer. Y'all, um, I cannot wait for these. Also, I think we should have some really fun stuff coming in the mail this week. Um, snip a quickie picture. Oh, and there goes the vacuum. And that vacuum <laughs> lets us know that we are at the end of our stream. <laughs> so uh, thanks to everyone for coming to the video store tonight. We will see you next week at 7 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Pacific. I have been one of your two clerks slash hosts, Adam Protexter. And I'm your other clerk slash host, Stephanie Thorson. And you have been an incredible group of people to hang out with every week. Yes. Uh, get home safe. Black Lives Matter. Watch more movies. Be kind. Rewind. And don't forget... 
that when you start doing your closing closing spiel on a stream, to have the mouse nearby so that you can toggle the end credits music and make it look somewhat rehearsed. Yes. are in a video store say you are in a video store 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 you are in a video store say you are in a video store 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 you are in a video store say you are in a video store 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 you are in a video store say you are in a video from Lubitsch to Mamoulian, Kubrick to Leone and Corbucci and Suzuki, these movies take it in New Orleans. We recommend it, yeah. Never pretentious, yeah. It's never rented, yeah. Just where our head is, yeah. It's one Kawhi and a slaughterhouse five. Those Hollywood nights are Hong Kong on fire. I could watch it all night for stop and rewind. Watch it again, you're strapped in, ain't no stopping the ride. Ask Ginger Rogers the time. Swing down to Broadway and light. See she e Mike, Tarkovsky, Almodovar, Von Sternberg, Dietrich, Garbo, Garfield, Heathcliff with Transformers over on the 80s TV show. You need a hand, we can reach it. Move in silence like we're now Melly is me. She'll spend an afternoons with Maya, then watch Freddy got fingered. It's all love for that silver screen. Now, baby, what that TV do? Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. And we here every week, too, so don't you touch that dial, bruh. We ain't skipping the previews. You are in a video store. Say you are in a video store, store, store. You are in a video store. Say you are in a video store, store, store. You are in a video store. Say you are in a video store, store, store. You are in a video store. Say you are in a video. You are in a video store. Say you are in a video store, store. You are in a video store, say you are in a video store. You are in a video store, say you are in a video store. You are in a video store, say you are in a video, you are in a video, you are in a video. Welcome to the rental shop, yeah. Welcome to the rental shop, yeah. Welcome to the rental shop, welcome to the rental shop, yeah. Welcome to the rental shop, yeah. Welcome to the rental shop. Yeah, if we don't get around to that one, I'll pay the